All right, we're live here in Washington, D.C. for really what is considered the second half of our broadcast here on this Saturday. Hello, everybody. Brian Glenn here at the uh, Washington Hilton Hotel. They're setting up behind us earlier. Of course, it was set up for all the speeches and the breakout panels. But today it is set up for a presidential dinner where President Trump is expected to speak at 7.30 here local time. He'll be brought on by former governor of Arkansas, Mike Huckabee at seven o'clock, but you're glad you're joining us as we kick off this uh, pre-show here. Now, earlier today, you know, today was a little different than yesterday. We saw a little bit more of your presidential candidates uh, yesterday speak. We saw Ron DeSantis, Vivek Ramasamy, uh, and others. And today it was a little bit more of your conservative personalities and people in pop culture and radio and television. Uh, and it did not disappoint at all. Uh, I encourage you to go back and look at some of the, the fo earlier footage we had on Rumble if you missed it. But it was all kicked off by Nick Adams. He is an author. He is a personality, a conservative personality. He has a book out, and we'll bring the book on uh, here a little bit later in the show. But he talked about the importance of strong men in our society. And from a biblical standpoint, men are providers. Men are made to be uh, strong leaders in our, in, our, in our society. And he talked about how we wouldn't have uh, drag queen shows. We wouldn't have some of this stuff in our society if it was not for uh, basically pushing out strong men and leadership positions in our country. And of course, it wrapped up with a powerful speech by Judge Jeanine Pirro, uh, who has a book out, by the way. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well. But she talked about everything, and it's really how America is under attack from all types uh, of, of aspects in this country. And so uh, hopefully we we're going to try to have her come on a little bit later. Not sure if that's possible, but we will certainly try for that. So. All in between, it was excellent. We had even uh, Rep Rep Representative Barry Loudermilk come on and talk about a little bit of the historical, the, the military background on that. We also had uh, Carrie Lake come on. And she has a book called Unafraid. Uh, uh, the, the story is ju I've just begun is the title of her book. Uh, she came on to talk about not only the attack that we're seeing in our elections, but also the attack we're having from a spiritual attack in our country. Uh, we also had Nikki Haley, who was uh, uh, running for president as well in 2024, uh, delivered a great speech. And actually, if you go back to yesterday, uh, Ralph Reed, who is uh, the executive director of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, had come out uh, with, I think, a very great statement about being respectful to those uh, in, you know, on stage and then we're coming on stage you might not always agree uh, with them politically but we need to show respect we're all people of faith here and I think that was an excellent statement that he has made and you know I was trying to see what the reaction would be from several people here uh, when they took the stage we saw uh, former Vez vice president Mike Pence take the stage I was kind of curious to see what type of reception he got very kind of a warm golf clap if you will uh, lieutenant governor Mark Robinson of North Carolina in my opinion was one of the leaders yesterday as far as getting the most crowd response when he came out and he even publicly uh, supported and endorsed uh, for president, President Donald Day Trump. So he got a warm reception there. And then of course, uh, the night yesterday closed out with Governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, and he delivered a great speech and, and, and got, you know, as you would expect, some applause here in the room as well. But you're glad you're joining us. We're gonna get into an interview here in just a second, but first I'm gonna thank our friends over at My Patriot Supply. Now, with all the chaos that's going on in the world, do you have an emergency plan that if something was to go down, if you lose electricity, uh, acts of war, a food shortage, something like that, well, it's good to know that you have companies like My Patriot Supply that are ready to supply the food that you need, you know, a 2,000 calorie a day diet from breakfast to lunch to dinner they all have it right there you can get a special uh, four week storage package we've got it on sale go to the website that's on your screen right now it's prep2023.com that's prep2023.com for a great four week a starter kit to make sure that you're prepared. Now, you know, there's people have been talking about this for years, and this segment uh, in the industry has only gotten more and more popular because people now realize that of all the things that are going on in the world right now, there is a possibility uh, that you could basically run out of food. And of course, this stuff is nutritious, it's delicious, and we encourage you to uh, stock up and be prepared for in case an emergency happens. Go to My Patriot Supply, the information. 
is on your screen. Go check it out, My Patriot Supply. And don't forget about that promo code, RSBN, when you check out. Let me step aside and let you a chance to take a look at now what it looks like a fine dining room. And I kind of wish at one point I had a table for eight right now because I'm getting a little hungry. But this is what you're looking at. Uh, this was a special event. Uh, you had to be, uh, you had to buy a sp separate ticket for this dinner. So this is not something that uh, you might have went to in the general session the last two days. Uh, you had to buy a special ticket for this dinner. Uh, like I said, Mike Huckabee, former governor of Arkansas, will be on um, at 7 o'clock. And then President Trump is scheduled to take that stage right behind me at 7.30 and will deliver a message to what looks like to be probably about 800 people or so. And I'll try to get a head count on that on this very special thing. I want to bring in Ryan Huffenbaum. He is the uh, executive director of the Freedom Center and he's also a part of the Liberty University, which we are very, very familiar with. And you, I met you right after uh, I had gotten fired from the mainstream media for being a conservative and being a Christian and supporting President Trump, but that ended up being the best thing to ever happen to me. And I, I'm going to tell you this, I think I told you this in person, but when I first went to Liberty U uh, and met you, you had never met me, you heard about my story, and you said, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. And you did right there, and that meant so much to me because I will say, out of all the friends I had on social media and all the friends in my immediate circle, you were the first person to actually lay hands on me and pray for favor, God's favor, and I'll never forget that. I'm, I'm so grateful for you in that moment. Uh, Brian, we love you at Liberty University, and I was so grateful to meet you at that time. What an amazing event, by the way, Faith and Freedom. Uh, it, you know, it reminds me, we were just having a discussion off camera, but without faith, freedom is not possible. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. We have this in the rotunda there at Liberty University. We have this verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It basically says this, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is liberty. So what an amazing event. Uh, I'll just say this, uh, for our part at Liberty University, we're training champions for Christ. We're keeping the mission. We graduated our largest student body ever just this last May. To over 28,000 students and we have K through 12 education over 18,000 students right now doing K through 12 online with Liberty University. Now why do you think it has grown that much? I mean is it are people realizing that uh, the other universities that you can go to you're not necessarily going to get an education you're going to get an indoctrination what do you attribute to this rise in enrollment? You know, I wish it was because the country is doing so well. I wish that was the case. But the sad reality is, is there's such a stark contrast today. There are many places uh, around the country where colleges are just finishing schools for liberals. That's all it is. It's all indoctrination. And they're not actually training them how to be working professionals with jobs that matter and matter for the future. So we are training up young people to live out their faith, but competent Intently, to with excellence, right? To be champions as doctors, as nurses, as law students, right? Who are going to go on and, and take on professional careers that will make a difference. There's a lot of parents right now that are watching us at home and said, yes, I want to get my kid out of general studies. And that was probably at one point that that's what I was in, into a career that we can actually make a living at, raise a family, make enough money where you can actually be, uh, you know, participate in society without always trying to scramble to look for a job. And we've seen how some of these students come out of these really highly, uh, you know, they have all these credits and stuff, all these Ivy League schools, but they simply cannot find a job because they studied, you know, underwater basket weaving for women's studies in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, something crazy like that. But it's good that you guys are training students to go out in the real world and get a job. Yeah, we have over 17 colleges, 700 degree programs at Liberty University, and they do matter. And you're exactly right. There are many schools where there's all kinds of fake studies, critical theory, gender theory, all of this stuff. It's nonsensical. Today in 2023, more than ever, we need to train up the next labor force that is going to lead this economy and lead the world. Yeah, you can walk around some of the halls, and I'm not going to name the buildings in Washington, D.C., because I've walked them, but there is departments that's for diversity, inclusion. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, um, isn't that the exact opposite of what Martin Martin Luther King uh, wanted as far as we should all be judged by the content of our, our character, not the color of our skin, but it seems like that doesn't matter these days. Yeah, I mean, sadly, this is that movement 
that woke movement is a Marxist movement. It's been hijacked by leftist authoritarians that want to dismantle everything. And they took the very best representations out of the civil rights movement, out of Dr. King, and they flipped the whole narrative and in order to destroy this country. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the reason why we're here, the reason you're here. Of course, those words, faith and freedom, the road to majority. How big is a role of, of faith play in this next election coming up? You know, we always like to say this is the most important election of our lifetime. And we said that back in 2020. We said that during the midterms, the most important midterm. But now I really feel like the last 18 months has shown us that we cannot go any further with the White House that we have and the Senate that we have, we need to get some bills passed and get things turned around. So 2024 is setting up to be a pivotal election. How much does faith play in that? Faith is huge, Brian, as always. I, I just want to I would say this. Social, spiritually active and governance engaged, sage conservatives are the ones who are leading the way. This is a family meeting. We're going to have disagreements here right now. This is the, the candidate process, right? But at the end of the day, people of faith come out in large droves. And, and, and in the last election, they were a big, big part of that turnout. So I, I think that what, what we're seeing right now over the last 18 months is when there's a vacuum, something comes and fills the void. What's going to fill that void? It At the end of the day, folks in this room are going to determine what fills that void. Okay, a year ago today is when we saw the Dobbs case get thrown down to basically reverse the Roe v. Wade and put it back on the states as it, as it should be. Um, I saw you had a picture up on Instagram earlier. I was there uh, as, as our viewers were there as well. What does today mean to you? Like we're we're a year past that that mark, and where are we headed? Where do you think we should go in terms of of of, of pro life? Well, I see vindication in what God has done. So we give glory to God for this movement. Uh, it's faithful women and faithful men who have led this movement have not stopped talking about abortion, have not mar stopped marching for abortion, uh, a pro life movement, and have have basically gave of their of their time, talent, and treasure in order to to advance the pro life cause. So today there was a big celebration at the Lincoln Memorial. Many groups came out. Students for Life was was uh, the co-sponsor of that event. They were really leading the way in organizing that. Other groups like Concerned Women for America and many others were showing out in large number. And so this is the first year that we've had to we've had the opportunity to celebrate that. We should celebrate that. You know, everybody's celebrating pride. We need to be celebrating life in this country, and we need to we need a, a pro marriage and pro family movement to start up again. I was just going to say. Some of the, the things that we battle in culture, and you, you mentioned pride, and, and for June it became this instant, yeah. we're going to throw our sexuality around and force it down your throat and embrace it whether or not you like it. We actually found out what happens when corporations pander to what I call, Ryan, a very small economic sector of our society, because if you think about this for a second, the backlash that Bud Light got, they got a nuclear bomb on Bud Light, all right? I, I don't know anybody who drinks it. Uh, I didn't drink it before. I didn't, I didn't need that movement to tell me that that was not the beer for me to drink. I don't, didn't go there. But here's my point. Where is the economic counter reaction to that movement? You would think what soon as a brand comes out to support that community and they get kicked back up, you know, from conservatives, wouldn't you think that segment of the economic base would rise up to overshadow the um, boycott that's going on. I don't think that economic strength is there. I've said it years ago. I, I say it again. That is not something corporations should pander to. Just sell your product and just go and stay out of politics. Yeah, I agree with you. There's something weird's going on. Something's amuck with economics right now. A lot of it has to do with ESG, BlackRock, Vanguard, these, these woke um, corporations that are leveraging their power by the trillions to overcome Main Street USA. Yep. So when, when you're talking about most Americans, it's not a populist movement. It's an elitist movement from the top down. Yep. They're the ones controlling that. If you can sustain a boycott, if you can sustain it, guess what? You can completely overturn. It. It's about the sustainability, really, of the willing. It's about the sustainability of Main Street USA overturning the will 
of Wall Street. Yeah, I've always said these executives need to stay in the boardroom and stay out of the break room when it comes to writing policies. Dave Brown is great. Yeah. When I see Dave Brown on War Room talking to Steve Bannon about all this stuff, he is a genius. And I shout out to Dave Brown on this because he really does explain it. So we got this culture world going on where we've got you know this this transgender movement, and of course uh, there 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 is you know I was leaving some of the president's stuff. You know we've we've got to get it where these kids in elementary school are not questioning whether or not they're a, a male or a female. We need to take that away. It, it, it's really brainwashing a generation to A, deny a maker yeah. and deny their gender. Yeah, I wholly agree with that. Basically, this is an evangelistic movement on the left, and that's what's happening. It's indoctrination. I mean, they are proselytizing to the next generation. And what we're discovering as parents and conservatives is, wait a second, education really is evangelism. So if you don't control education, you cannot control the future. And, and, and Stalin knew that. Mao knew that. Right. Hitler knew that. We have to get that back. For conservative values. Okay, in your inner circle of family, friends, people you go to grocery store with, church work, what's their pulse on this next election? No, no, no matter who that candidate is, and, and that's disregard, but are they optimistic? They have faith that that a God is in control, and and it's and we all we all should not stress and have anxiety. We know how that's. We're told not to do that. It's hard not to have anxiety. But what what are you sensing in this next election? I think I sense that people are hopeful. Uh, you know, optimism that's not based on rooted on any foundation or principle is not really a plan for or a strategy for the future. But people are hopeful because they believe in God. They trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So many of those conversations I'm having with those kinds of people, they're hopeful. They're praying. They're prayerful. But they ultimately want to be engaged with this process, and that's the most important thing. You have to get engaged. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, you just took the questions right out of my head. How do people get engaged? What's the bit of encouragement you give somebody that might be watching this right now that wants to get off the couch and get involved, whether that's a school board, your city council, or hey, maybe they want to go volunteer at a college or something like that. What, what bit of advice do you have for them? The first thing I would encourage them to do is pray. Pray for this country. Pray for God's uh, divine providence and his leading for his hand, his blessing on this country. The second thing is you really need to think about what going on around you and recess, where is it that you can be the, the biggest help? It might be in your local public school. It might be in a mayoral race in your community. Whatever it might, might be, the city council, um, the, the, the school board, whatever it is, think about what's going on and where you could be the most useful. And then at the end of the day, you got to vote. I mean, you really do have to vote. And so I would encourage people in your, in your neighborhood, your district precinct, I'd go knock on doors and I would encourage people to be registered to vote. I don't tell people how to vote, but I do want them to know what those issues are yeah, of greatest concern. And guess what? They're going to make the right decision. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up is to give over because I know there are some studies that people may be so active on social media uh, to, to, for a candidate, but on election day, they don't get out and vote for whatever reason. They don't vote. So you need, we need to swarm the polls on that and vote. Okay. You've, you've been here the last couple of days. What has been some of the speakers for you that kind of stood out or maybe you guys at Liberty you, you had him over at your media booth interviewing. Anybody stood out to you or something they said that really kind of sparked that interest? Well, I'd say Tiffany Justice, Moms for Liberty. I'm so impressed with that organization. They're a grassroots organization that started in 2021. They have over 200,000 members today, chapters all across this country. Their big national conference is just ne this next week. I, you, brought, you guys might be there, but I'll just tell you, that's an organization on the move. Uh, I always love catching up with Father Frank Pavone, yeah. Priest for Life. I appreciate the stand. He is he has gotten a lot of knocks, but man, <laughs> that guy is bold, and I really yeah. do appreciate him. Uh, I think you mentioned earlier uh, Congressman Loudermilk. Uh, what an amazing testimony, not only to the history of this country, but God's blessing on America. We're coming up on July 4. You know, we celebrate everything else. It seems like Brian, except the thing. That that mattered the most, and that's the founding of this country. And we have to be reminded of what it took for those those uh, the 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 bands of unity to yeah. to come together and to sign, to write and draft the, the Declaration of Independence, and to sign that document. It was their death warrant. But listen, 
that was the most significant thing that changed the course of human history for the entire world. Yeah, I just wish that people got excited about this country uh, and, and, and less excited about celebrating sexuality or any one of these, uh, you know, Marxist things. I, I loved that, um, and I, I, the gentleman's name has surpassed me, but Upper Church uh, from North Carolina. He, uh, uh, yeah, John Am John Amanchukwu. Amanchukwu. Yeah. Uh, amazing, and he did did push up on that quite a bit. Yes, uh, and by the way, I'd recommend to folks, get the book in, um, Erased. That's oh. one of the books that he, he just wrote that book. Fantastic work that he's done, uh, raising awareness to what's going on with wokeism. Wow, okay. Let's step aside, show the scene real quick. We'll take a little bit, little bit of pause. All right, as you uh, see now, they're having some dinner there, it looks like. I, and let me ask you a question. You've got, you're sitting ton tonight, you've got a table. Oh, yeah. Uh, was this a no-brainer to buy a ticket to, oh. to not only see Mike Huckabee, which is great, probably yes. one of the best governors of Arkansas, and at one point presidential candidate, a great guy, great supporter of President Trump, but it was a no-brainer to be here tonight. Absolutely, you can't miss it, especially with with a powerhouse like Huckabee, and of course, the former president, we always want, it's always a lively discussion when he gets up on the stage. So uh, I, I'm excited, just like you, Brian, waiting with anticipation for the start of tonight. And uh, it's going to be fireworks, as always. Okay, if someone wants to uh, get more information on Liberty U, the Freedom Center, get involved and say, hey, I've got a student that's graduating from high school yeah. and they don't know where they want to go. And shout out to Grace Sadanya, our editor-in-chief actually took the online class from you guys and I don't, don't know where the status of that is, but she enjoys it. I've been to your campus. It is absolutely amazing. And yes, it does have a ski slope at the university. and It's got one of the best uh, athletic facilities around, but how can people get more information on that? Okay, I'm going to mention a few things. Liberty.edu. Folks, check Check it out. I mean, listen, anywhere from kindergarten all the way to a PhD, liberty.edu is where you go. Find out about all of the course offerings that we have. Also, resources on politic, political engagement from a biblical world view. We're a C3. We don't endorse a party or a political candidate, but go check out standingforfreedom.com standingforfreedom.com. Check that out as well, and we have a bunch of resources there. Okay, how can people get a hold of you on follow you on social media? So, at R. Helfenbein on Twitter, I'm, I'm there. Uh, I don't tweet that often, but from time to time, you'll see a lot of interesting content. I really appreciate God bless you. You're one of, Like I said, that story I told you earlier is amazing. You were the first person to prey on me, and I think it was only about... 30 days after that, I got picked up by right side. It has absolutely changed my life. Thank you very much. God bless you, Brian. We appreciate you. It brings tears to my eyes to think about that. Thank you, Ryan. All right, take a look at the screen. Uh, also, I want to talk about our friends over at... Oh, I love these guys. Blackout Coffee. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Blackout Coffee. Go to blackoutcoffee.com. Blackoutcoffee.com. Not only are they a great, great patriot... But they've got some great coffee. I've got the blueberry crumble I've been drinking the last day or so. They've got a light roast, a medium roast, and a very bold roast. Uh, you're going to enjoy it. And guess what? Not only is it great coffee, but you're supporting conservative values because they do so much within the conservative community. So go check it out, blackoutcoffee.com. That's blackoutcoffee. Dot com. Don't forget to put that promo code RSBN. That is one way that we are able to track everything, right? Be able to tell these people, hey, our viewers are coming to you and they're buying those that great product. So please check it out, blackoutcoffee.com, blackoutcoffee.com. Taking a look at the stage there as it looks a little different than it did earlier. It uh, has flipped this room completely from a, um, you know, more of a speaker setup with the audience to more of a dinner uh, scenario and we are happy that you guys are on us. This is day two. It actually started, it did start on, I believe on Thursday, small breakout sections, but uh, the real the real magic happened on Friday. Friday was more um, politician driven, is more candidate driven, had more elected officials in there. Uh, and then today was a little bit more of your conservatives. I mean, your personalities, your media can, online influencers, things like that. Benny Johnson was hilarious. Uh, he was a second man up behind Nick Adams today and talked about uh, him 
you know, living in D.C. and, and experiencing all of the uh, the terror and stuff that it comes with uh, living in a city that has out of, out of you know, out of hand crime. Uh, he was great. Talked about that. By the way, the room that you're looking at right now is where the White House Correspondents' Dinner is held. So, this is when you've seen the clips uh, on TV. This this is the room that is held in. And plus, back on this uh, on March 30th of 1981, uh, at the time, President Ronald Reagan, there was an assassination attempt right outside this hotel, on the streets, alongside this. Uh, Washington Hilton back in late March of 1981. Uh, and earlier, they were talking about uh, how the person who assassinated or the attempt, attempt assassination of, of Ronald Reagan uh, spent some jail time, was out, but all of the people that had committed the crimes uh, against our country and have done other stuff Rome free. So it's just kind of the irony of all of that. But uh, we're glad you're joining us. Also, I want to talk about the, uh, and I've gotten a lot of feedback on the articles of impeachment that were dropped late May. Margie Taylor Greene dropped five articles of impeachment, one of them being on President Biden for uh, numerous reasons. And, and, and there's been so, so much evidence come out against President Biden, uh, the FD 1023s, we got the SARS report that came out of the Department of Treasury uh, that shows the family of uh, the group of LLCs that were all combined getting money filtered through those through about nine to 10 uh, Biden family members. This is all verifiable stuff. This did not come from, this is not some type of conspiracy or some theory that a podcaster on the internet is putting out. This is coming from the FD 1023 from an FBI skiff and from the Department of Treasury. This is all the evidence that is that is all bundled up together to basically back the articles of impeachment on Joe Biden. But here's what's happening, and I probably the number one message I get on social media is what is happening to the impeachment of Biden and Christopher Ray of the FBI and others. And I'm just going to tell you flat out right now. They're not getting support from the conference. There's zero support. I can't say zero. There's a few people that have backed them. But overwhelmingly, zero support from Republicans in the House for whatever reason. Now, one of the reasons that I was told that some people aren't backing it is they say their constituents don't support the impeachment of Joe Biden. And I just can't understand where they're coming from on that because I don't think there's another person in this room right now, maybe a couple out in the other room that have a better pulse of what the base wants that we talk to people we listen to these speakers we we listen to the reaction we get it with our network and the american people are fed up with a two-tier justice system they're over it they want some type of retribution some type of justice for the crimes that joe biden has done because keep in mind president trump was impeached twice once for what he would describe as a perfect phone call with Zelensky. You can read the transcripts. There's nothing wrong. He was basically questioning him on a prosecutor that was looking into Hunter Biden. We all know what Joe Biden said on the air, on live television, about firing this prosecutor. He wasn't going to get the money. And then he was also impeached for, uh, for inciting for January 6th, for basically saying we're going to peacefully walk down the Capitol and, and let our voices be heard. But despite... All of the evidence that we have on Joe Biden in the crime family, House Republicans still cannot come together and collectively back these articles of impeachment. So this is where you come in. This is where you can help. You need to call your local or your, your, your congressman, congresswoman in your district. Call the district number. Call the, eight, the, the 202 district local number here in the Capitol. Ask for your for your representative and let your voices be heard. Let them know that, hey, you're over. You, you want to see these articles of impeachment carry on. And you, you simply do not want to allow this to happen. I'm going to step aside and let you guys check out the crew. We also want to thank our friends over at the Birch Gold Group. Right now, the Birch Gold Group wants you to switch over your traditional IRA into a gold back 
IRA. That is one thing that you can do to protect your future. We've seen what the dollar has been doing. We've seen what the chaotic uh, the, the currency is doing around the world. Do not let your savings go to waste. Do not let your retirement get taken away because Biden has no clue what he's doing. Instead, what you need to do right now is text the words Trump. Text the words Trump to 989898. That's Trump to 989898. Nine, eight. That is a Birch Gold Group, and they'll show you how to transfer from a traditional IRA into a gold back to IRA. And we're not saying it's for everybody, but they're going to send you a free information kit and let you decide. It's that easy, that low pressure, and thousands of our viewers have done just that. So please, take a moment before everything starts off here in about an hour. Go check it out. Text the words Trump to 989898. That is the Birch Gold Group. We certainly appreciate their participation in all of our broadcasts, and they've been a great uh, partner for a lot of things that we do. We want to we'll make sure that we all protect ourselves uh, from a crumbling potential economy. All right, we're glad you're joining us, taking a look at some of the People in here tonight, I'll try to get an estimate of just how many people are in here right now. I would probably say this was, uh, you know, this is a special ticketed event separate from the speakers we had earlier. So uh, they had to, to, you know, to purchase a ticket. And I'm hoping to get Timothy Head. He is the uh, executive director of Faith and Freedom Coalition. So maybe we'll have him on here before too long to talk a little bit about uh, this organization and, and what their mission is. Now, I was on their website earlier. And it talks about, they, they focus on all kinds of stuff, the immigration, religious freedom, uh, the family, uh, and how important pro-life is. And like I said earlier, we're coming up on basically uh, one year after the reverse of Roe v. Wade. So that is a special, uh, obviously, uh, time in in American history that, that that has happened. And of course, that was a Mississippi Dobbs case that was reversed uh, and flipped the rights to abortion back down to the states. We also came off of what we considered one of the greatest hoax in modern political history, and that has been the weaponization of the FBI. And let's talk a little bit about Adam Schiff, Shifty Schiff, as uh, President Trump would call him, pencil neck Schiff, and how he was basically caught in a lie, pushing the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax, which basically really uh, derailed a lot of the independent voters right ahead of the 2020 election. And so uh, that hoax of Russia, Russia, Russia was something that we had to, as conservatives and have as Trump supporters, had to deal with for a matter of time until it was proved that it was none of it was really true. And then, of course, Adam Schiff sat on intelligent boards, on committees that people you know, trusted that Adam Schiff, being that he was on these intelligent positions and had all this intel, that he would know that there's no way that he would just be making this stuff up for political purposes, that he had to have evidence to back up the Russia, Russia, Russia. And that does kind of go along the 51 intelligent agencies that also put their name that said that Hunter Biden's laptop was absolutely not real. It was, it was Russia misinformation. Remember? 51 people told you it was Russia mis misinformation until we all found out that that was true and the Russia, Russia, Russia was one big lie. Well, la last week, uh, Congress came together and they voted to censor Adam Schiff, which he, he should be censored. Now, the last person, that is a 26th person in congressional history to be censored. Okay, the first person ever to be censored it was goes back, dates way back, and it was for basically calling out the Speaker of the House, criticizing the Speaker of the House. And there's several reasons over history why people have been censored from Congress. Now, if you want to go back before shift, it was uh, Congressman Paul Gosar for over a meme, over a meme uh, that was viewed as being insensitive and likely, I guess, incited some type of violence. So that's what he was censored. But that is very pale compared to what Adam Schiff was censored for because we all know that the Russia, Russia, Russia was one big lie and he pushed that lie. Now, what happened on the House floor? 
after he was censored? Let me tell you what happened. The, the Democrats rallied around him to show support of uh, Adam and basically looked like some kind of high school pep rally for him. He's all smiling. Nancy Pelosi was there clapping and screaming and yelling in support. They think he's a hero for what he did. They think that Adam Schiff was only censored because he stood up to President Trump and he proved to America that he was compromised by Russia, which we all know never happened and it didn't happen, and that's why he was censored. So there's a little bit of, I guess, a victory, if you want to say we haven't seriously, you know, think about in the grand scheme of things, have been, had very many wins of, of lately uh, since we took over the House, but we are slowly uh, making that happen. Also, there are a movement right now to expunge the uh, impeachments on President Trump. At least the phonic from New York, Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia, have come together to basically introduce uh, a, a motion to expunge those impeachments. So what that would essentially do is erase uh, the impeachments off of the, uh, President Trump's record, which both of them were viewed as uh, basically a sham, a witch hunt, with no verifiable proof of any one of them. Hopefully, hopefully, Republicans can come together and make that happen. Now, I think this is one of the most litmus tests that we can have to find out who is in the, the which of the conservatives rather than the Republican Party are for America first and are for, I guess you could say, even President Trump by seeing who votes for that. Uh, I think it's interesting that eight out of the ten Republicans that voted to impeach President Trump I believe on the first impeachment, eight out of ten are no longer in Congress. They've been sent packing. Uh, two are still remain in Congress. So this next round of public voting, in other words, um, putting your name, putting your money where your mouth is, um, you, let's, let's see what happens on that because I think this is a good way to uh, really uh, find out exactly who has the best interest for the Republican Party and who is just in office uh, for self-filling. I mean, instead of serving the people, they serve themselves. Uh, talk a little bit about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I, I'm becoming more and more a fond of this guy every time I see an interview. And he's gone on, uh, goes on a lot of CNN uh, interviews and MSNBC. And I love to see him challenge uh, back on stuff. And I really, I read an article the other day that he's almost, you know, past President Trump as being someone that the media absolutely hates now. And of course, we know the track record on on how the media treats uh, President Trump. It's been, I think, 482 hours on Trump indictments versus zero hours on anything related to Joe Biden and Hunter Biden, all that scandal. So we haven't seen any fair coverage as far as that is concerned. Uh, but Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is one of these individuals that has really pushed back on, on, the, on, on the Democrats. And we saw earlier, uh, a couple months ago, that President Biden said he is no longer going to debate anybody from the Democratic Party as far as the primary goes. And I, I, I said this uh, about two years ago, and I'll say it again uh, tonight. I truly believe that Joe Biden will not be the nominee from the Democrats. I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's going to be I think it's going to be Gavin Newsom in California. I said that before, and I'll say it again. There's a reason why he is running ads across the country. There was a reason why he was running ads in Florida, because we all know no one from Florida is moving from Florida to California. Matter of fact, the research will say the exact opposite. They're going from California to Texas to Florida to Virginia. They're not going to states uh, like California. So I really think that you're going to see Joe Biden pushed aside due to all of these allegations, all these things that are being discovered. Finally, you know, the media can't hide. The media cannot just push aside all of this information. They've got to cover it, and they're going to slow drip it out, all right, because they're going to be forced to slow drip it. It comes a point when the news becomes so big that they can't just not cover it. So what you're going to see is a slow walk to stage left and enter Gavin Newsom because their, their bench is not deep. I mean, it's not deep at all. Uh, I don't think Kamala Harris has the skill set to even do what she's doing now. She outkicked the coverage on that. There's a reason why she's vice president. We'll go over that another time. But she cannot. she's not qualified. So who are they going to bring in? They need a young, fresh face 
And if you watch the Sean Hannity interview with Gavin Newsom that he did uh, about two weeks ago, and I encourage you to find that interview, he actually, from a political standpoint and from a, a communicator standpoint, he did an excellent job. And Sean Hannity even said, uh, you know, I, I, I disagree with you on just about everything you've said so far. Uh, but at least you communicated it to our viewer, and that is something that President Biden is unable to do. So we live, unfortunately, in a culture where people will vote for someone based upon how they talk, how they look, how they act. Insert Barack Hussein Obama into that category. That's exactly why America swooned over him uh, early on, because he was an effective communicator, which I think Gavin Newsom is a very effective communicator. So let's see how uh, that all plays out uh, here over the next probably six months, I would think, to kind of get things moving along. And of course, as some of these investigations unfold more evidence, I feel like the Democrats will feel they'll have no, it will, it will, when you look at polling to begin with, they'll have no other choice but to move him aside and insert somebody else. I just don't see how they can win because the Democrats can only run on the fact that we hate Trump, we hate DeSantis, conservatives are bad. They can't run on a track record. They've had 18 months of a horrible track record. What are you gonna run on? The border is safe and secure? Economy is, is thriving? Inflation is low? Unemployment, I'll give it, is low. I don't think it's a true uh, indication of real unemployment. Are you going to run on world peace? Are you going to run on the fact that we have, uh, you know, international relations are the best they've ever been? There's no track record. So they've just got to run on the personality attacks on President Trump or whoever is in the race. Although, I will say, they, send, they tend to give people like Chris Christie a little bit more airtime than anybody because he is the one criticizing President Trump. So uh, stay tuned. Gavin Newsom, your Democratic nominee coming up. Let's step aside again. Take a look at everything as we move on this beautiful Saturday night in our nation's capital. And we are looking forward to a fantastic speech. And we're glad that you are joining us uh, tonight. As a reminder, go to our website rsbnetwork.com, rsbnetwork.com. Sign up for our newsletter. That's right, sign up for our newsletter. It's easy to do, no worries. We're not gonna spam you with a bunch of information that you don't wanna hear. We're gonna give you the information you need on topics that you love and adore. Topics that are well to your heart. So go check it out. Sign up for the newsletter. Grace Sadania, our editor-in-chief, which by the way, spoke at a breakout session here at Faith and Freedom. And unfortunately, I was unable to watch that, but I hope that someone out there has some video of that. I would love to uh, share that on our socials. And if Grace is watching, please send some of that video to us and we'll pump, pump it out and talk about it. Uh, but we're glad uh, that she was able to do that. So go check it out, rsbnetwork.com, rsbnetwork.com. Sign up for the newsletter and while you're there, Yes, we got some great partners for tonight. We got Birch Gold. We got Blackout Coffee. We got My Patriot Supply. We got the Trumpinator that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. But we've also got you, the viewer. And it is important to us that we stay in this fight. And it's only because of you guys watching us right now at home. Over the last several years, you have really stepped up and you have really played a big part in the success of this network. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you. So go check it out, rspnetwork.com slash donate. And in the words of Larry Elder, who delivered a video message here today, not in person, I wanted to see him in person, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. Throw a little something in tip jar is what he says. rspnetwork.com, rspnetwork.com. All right, I want to talk a little bit about China, and I'm sure President Trump will talk about China uh, tonight during his speech. And, you know, this is one of those things I said back in 2012. 2012 now. Go time stamp that. that, that at that time, businessman Donald J. Trump was the only person that had the plan to compete. Are you ready for it? China. 
Back in 2012, I said that on Facebook. I'll pull it up and prove it. So what's his plan now? Well, he had a plan in place, and he knew the threat that China you know, gave to the U.S., not from an economic standpoint, from ripping off our, our trademarks and our copyright infringements and all of, the, all of that. And we've got all of that side of China. But now they're floating spy balloons across our country. Now, you remember months ago that these spy balloons were just showing up in the Pacific Northwest, coming down through Canada after they drifted across Alaska, down through the upper Pacific Northwest, down through the central place of the country, going offshore there in South Carolina. And we only celebrated it when we shot it down over the water and it was like, yeah, take that, China. That's what we're going to show you when you float spy balloons over our country. But little did the American people know that they were flying those spy balloons over some very important real estate in this country. And it was only until after they gathered all of that, inter that information and sent it back to God knows where that we shot it down. And if it wasn't for people that lived in Montana that spotted something in the sky and said, wait a minute, what is that? Bef that the story even existed. So think about that for a second. If it wouldn't have been tracked early on, perhaps we wouldn't have even known that this spy balloon had flown over the entire country. So you've got that. You've got, you've got China basically throwing it in our face that we're going to spy on you. We're going to spy on your military bases. We're going to spy on all this infrastructure that you have. Important places. Important places that we had. But then now, you know, we're going to go down to Cuba. We're going to check out some real estate in Cuba because that looks like a fine place to set up shop in Cuba. So now we have China, who is not only an economic threat, not only a threat to Taiwan, which we kind of know that about 80% of all semiconductors that we, you and I use in products are vehicles, electronics, things like that are made in Taiwan. Uh, so there's a threat there, but now they're gonna have a threat a little bit closer to home, right off the coast of Florida. And I think this is important to note that none of this would have happened if President Trump was in office. We know this. He, he would not have allowed this to happen. And it's only happening because we have weak leadership in the White House. We have people in the White House. We have people in international foreign affairs that do not care about the interests of the United States and that we can go back and we can do about two, three hours on the Biden family and the connection to China and all of the, all of the money laundering going on. We can talk about that a little bit later if you want to. But our biggest threat right now is China and what they are doing to us. And that's why now more than ever, we must make sure that our stance on China is tough and we do not allow them to gather intel on, on, on all of this. And I know that I was reading some of the notes uh, that I got earlier on uh, on 47, on Trump's basically his videos, his plan for 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 47, and one a lot of it has to do with China, and what he would do to the intel agencies here, and now we have people that are in positions that are, are simply not uh, enforcing a, a lot of security protocols to protect American interest, not just from the business interest, but now it's I think our military interest. And China, a little known fact on China, has built more military ships than they have in history, than any global leading country has in history. So while they're building up their military with ships and they're building up their forces to defend China, we're doing drag shows. We're doing all kinds of gay pride stuff in our military because that's what's important to protect this country. It's not building up our military, making sure we have the finest equipment. It's making sure you have the dress that fits your body. And that's unfortunately the state of our military. And unfortunately, that's where we're at here in 2023. Let me step aside, show a little bit. Also remind everybody, go pick up this really cool. If you got somebody who collects Trump collectibles, memorabilia like that, check out this bobblehead. The Trumpinator. That's right, the Trumpinator. Now, every time we put one of these on the air, it absolutely sells out. It does. It sells out. So take a few minutes while we have 
and go online. The information is on your screen. Go on and check out the Trumpinator and get your hands on it. Now, I was on Trump Force One probably about a couple months ago, and I can confirm this is in the cockpit. Pretty cool. It's sitting up there. You might have saw some pictures online on that as well. So uh, they've got the Trumpinator. You go pick yours up today and uh, put it in your office, your home. Go check it out. The Trumpinator bobblehead, one of a kind. It will sell out. It will sell out for sure. So go get it while supplies last. Uh, we're glad you're joining us on this beautiful Saturday night. The room is definitely full now. People have made their way in here, obviously with the uh, presidential security protocol in place. The entry is uh, a little bit more, I guess you say, you know, it takes a little bit more time to get in the room due to all of that. But nevertheless, uh, we are glad uh, that you're joining us. And we're glad that people are streaming in here, sitting down for a great night uh, to hear from the president. Now, if you missed the speeches on uh, Friday and earlier today, I encourage you to go to Rumble uh, and, and watch those speeches. Uh, I've got a personal favorite, uh, Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina, Mark Robinson, just about brought down the house. Great. I mean, you might have, you know, not only is he a, a, an effective Lieutenant Governor for North Carolina, who got his start uh, by going to a city council meeting and, and, and voicing his concern about gun violence and said, look, you know, I'm a law-abiding, uh, you know, gun owner and I should not be penalized uh, because there's people in our society that absolutely should not have a handgun and they use it against innocent people. And we know the argument. A good guy with a gun beats a bad guy with a gun. So he made his uh, his you know, his, his, his instant fame, if you will, on that city council meeting and now has risen up to lieutenant governor. But he had a fantastic message here uh, yesterday that was just uh, tremendous. And I really enjoyed uh, watching him. Carrie Lake just spoke earlier today, did a book signing outside on her new book. Hopefully we'll have a few minutes to spend with her before she uh, gets going. Uh, she spoke a lot about faith and how she was led to step away from you know, a career in news, 28 years uh, as an anchor there in Phoenix, and was tired of seeing the way the media was covering uh, the events, especially post the uh, 2020 election, and decided she had enough and stepped out on a leap of faith to serve the American people. And I think it's a fantastic book, Unafraid. Go check it out. It's called Unafraid, Just Getting Started. Go check, check out that book. But she was a great speaker uh, that we had as well just a few days ago. So I encourage you to go check that out. Okay, so here's one of the things I want to talk about real quickly is, and President Trump talks about this in his speeches, and he's got this a great video. If you follow him, obviously on True Social, you'll see a lot of these campaign videos that he'll put out on various topics. I've got about 67 of them uh, that I've been reading over the last couple of days to catch up on his stance. And one of them is to protect our kids from this transgender movement that's underway. Now, right now in Congress, that is a bill that has been presented and they're looking for co-sponsors on this bill. And it's called Protect Children's Innocence Act. And it sounds, it is just what it reads, Protect Children's Innocence Act. Now, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, brought it to the floor. And what that does, it makes it a federal crime for a medical doctor to perform transgender surgeries on minors. That's someone under the age of 18. And what that is, is to stop kids from having double mastectomies, castration, puberty blockers, hormone treatment, all of these things that we cannot prove uh, that do not have long-term effects, negative long-term effects. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of evidence that a percentage of these people, these kids that are getting these transgender surgeries are having, are regretting it later in life. Chloe, Chloe Cole is one of them who is probably the leading activist on this, who transitioned 
and then later regretted it. Uh, but she has brought this to the floor, and she's looking for co-sponsors on that as well. And I know President Trump has said in his speeches that from day one he would make a medical procedure such as this a federal crime. And if you're 21 years old and you want to go through transition and surgery, God bless you. You have every right to do that. But this is meant to protect the children under 18, 13, 14, 15, even younger than that is being treated with hormone therapy. Now, you and I both know, and if you've got kids, I've got three kids, I can honestly tell you that at the age of 10, 11, 12 years old, my kids knew a couple of things. They knew that maybe I was an idiot and they wanted to go outside and play on the skateboard or do whatever. They weren't questioning their gender. I don't think an average kid does that at that age. So they don't have the intelligence, a level of thought to do something like that. So these kids are being brainwashed to think that they've got some type of gender dysphoria or some kind of confusion of what gender they have. So now they go through the process of switching and transitioning. And what happens is, is there's a percentage of these kids that react negatively to that or they, res they regret doing it. So all this does is give people a little bit more time to think about if that's something they want to do and they'll make it a crime that if a doctor performs something like that. So I think this is very important. And once again, call your legislator and ask them, do you su protect children's? Do you protect, do you support the Protect Children's Innocent Act and let your voices be heard? It's something I know that President Trump talks about uh, at his campaign rally speeches, and I wanted to bring it up uh, here tonight. So Protect Children's Innocent Act. we got to protect our kids. And like I said, it's not an anti-gay bill. It's not an anti-LBGTQ bill. It is just protecting our kids from, the, from uh, genital mutilation. All right, step aside as we uh, make our way. It's 626 locally. We're so glad you're joining us uh, here on this Saturday night. I want to remind everybody you can follow all of us across our social media platforms at RSBN. And you can go to True Social at RSBN. You can go to our Facebook page, our Rumble page. Rumble has been absolutely great. Uh, we appreciate your, all your support on our Rumble page. Uh, go check it out. Go follow us on, on YouTube as well. Hey, there was a point in time where when we switched over to doing more stuff on Rumble because the other streaming platform kept giving us strikes, uh, I think it's very, very uh, encouraging that there are platforms out there that are allowing free speech, allowing free speech to flourish, and Rumble is one of them. So go check it out. Go to our Rumble page. Go follow us on Twitter. Go follow us across several platforms and make sure you stay in touch with what's going on uh, across our network. And you can also follow us on Twitter. You know, there's a point where, you know, right after, well, right after January 6th, uh, we had a ton of, um, you know, basically shadow banning. It's because if you said the words Trump or you said the words, you know, January 6th, if you talked about that, you were instantly, you know, pushed from oblivion of having any type of footprint um, going on. So uh, Rumble was a great company, so we're glad that Rumble. I was jumping on Locals earlier and uh, jumped on there to talk. I did a book signings that was really cool that we streamed on this. If you don't follow us on Locals as well, make sure you sign up for Locals. It's easy, it's affordable, and it kind of it's a way one way to kind of get behind the scenes on what we do here uh, at the network. And it's real easy to do when you go to the Rumble. You can actually see the click down where you can subscribe to us on uh, Locals. You can also go to our Instagram page. You can follow me at Brian Glenn TV at Brian Glenn TV on Instagram and Twitter, uh, which is, um, you know, one, one of our most active platforms that as a network that we definitely stream from. So we're glad you're doing that. We're glad you're joining us. As you can see, the room has filled up. People are coming in here. Uh, we'll kind of recap a little bit. We're going to have a um, former governor, Mike Huckleby, will come in here and, and talk a little bit about uh, his experience is in obviously, um, you know, probably his time in office as governor of Arkansas and, 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 and in, a, in a 
you know, a, a good supporter of President Trump. He's been a good ally of President Trump. And of course, his daughter is just was elected uh, this past election to be the governor of Arkansas, and she has done an amazing job there. And of course, coming off uh, the president uh, being a um, uh, a um, communications uh, press secretary, fantastic job, and that is one job that I don't think. Uh, well, I can I can tell you I would much rather be the press secretary for President Trump than I would be for President Biden because I think it might be an almost impossible to try to spin in a positive way some of the things that are going on with the Biden administration. But he'll be speaking at 7 o'clock and then 7.30, 7.30, President Trump taking the stage there. But we're so glad you're joining us. And I do want to remind everybody, our friends over at Blackout Coffee. You got to love it. Blackout Coffee. Um, great patriotic company. They source their beans fresh. They've got fresh coffee. And you, when you go on to blackoutcoffee.com, not only can you click whether or not you want it ground, you want whole bean, perhaps you want it in a cup, little K cups. You got that. You can also pick your flavors light, a light roast, a medium roast or a dark, kind of a heavy blend roast, something really going to wake you up. But not only are you going to get in fresh coffee, you're, you're supporting a patriotic company. Blackout Coffee, they're one of us. They're a conservative company. They love, they're a patriotic company. They love this country. They celebrate this country. And they want to ship you some great coffee. So go over to blackoutcoffee.com. That's blackoutcoffee.com. And um, order some coffee today. I got the blueberry crumble I just had this morning. It's absolutely delicious. Go check it out. Blackoutcoffee.com. That's blackoutcoffee.com. All right. So as we wait for President Trump, I was kind of looking over some of the agendas, agenda items that he had. I'm going to give a second to pull that up on my phone. Um, but he also, one of his things on here is we must demand peace in Ukraine. And we kind of know that, you know, Biden has been doing what he's been doing for the last 10 months. He's been basically leading us into World War III with sending American tanks. And it's, you know, far past the time for our parties involved to pursue uh, a peaceful end. I, I feel like we, we've gotten to a point where, um, you know, I don't know if it's going to take a lot of negotiation to have a peaceful end to what's going on in Ukraine. And I think we'd all agree that, you know, he said many times before that Russia's invasion of Ukraine would have never happened if he was in the White House. It wouldn't even be thinkable. Not even a possibility. Hang on. Just a announcement over the loudspeaker here in Spanish. I'm sure they're going to tell everybody to get seated before too long. The program's going to start. But we all kind of know that the war in Ukraine would not be going on right now if President Trump was indeed in office. It simply would not be going on at all. Uh, so peace in, the, in, in Ukraine. And then basically stopping the Chinese espionage. We talked a little bit about the Chinese spy balloons and the push to now the China having a type of um, presence uh, in, in Cuba and setting up shop in Cuba. And this is just basically miles offshore of, um, of the U.S. And so that we've allowed that to happen over the several last several months as well um, under the Biden administration. So stopping China is a big uh, to do is on a big, a, a basically to do list for President Trump. Excuse me, um, of that. Let's talk about making America independent again as far as energy. If you recall, when President Trump left office, uh, gasoline was around 179 a gallon, I believe, and we do, we definitely know what has happened. Um, since Biden has taken over. Now, Joe Biden's war on American energy is one of the key drivers of the worst inflation in 58 years. And it's hitting every single American family very hard. 
Now, what Biden did, he reversed every action possible that President Trump took to be energy independent. And as soon as we're going to be energy dominant all over the world, he basically reversed course on that. Now, he canceled the Keystone XL pipeline. Remember that? Canceled it. He also reentered the horrendous Paris Climate Accord that was so unfair to the United States, but it was also you know, good for other countries, but bad for us. He put a huge roadblock to new oil and gas coal production. Biden's anti-American energy crusade is a massive tax hike on everything. Now think about that for a second. Everything that we get is affected to fuel, fossil fuel, gasoline, oil, everything is affected. So if that goes up, everything else goes up. It is, matter of fact, one of the speakers, I think, let's, okay. Okay, the problem. The program is going to be in, begin in five minutes, so give me a chance to uh, tell you one more time to support all of our partners for today. And I can't stress enough about your retirement. Go over to the Birch Gold Group. They're going to show you how to basically go from a traditional IRA into a gold-backed IRA. And you can do that really easy. Text the words TRUMP to 989898. That is the Birch Gold Group, and they will teach you how to do that. They're going to send you a free information kit. It won't cost you any money to do that. But what that's going to do is historically, gold has outperformed the markets. So they're going to show you how to do it. Protect your investment and your savings with the Birch Gold Group. Text Trump to 989898 for your free information kit. Look, they've been a partner of this network now going on for a year and a half or so. And we have seen thousands of our viewers go over to the website, get that free information kit that you're going to text Trump to and, and, and be able to secure some of their 401ks. We're not saying that all of it. We're not. And they're going to let you, they're the experts, not us, but they're the experts. So why not text them right now? Trump to 989898, the Birch Gold Group for more. Also support uh, My Patriot Supply. Don't forget about those guys. We've been talking about uh, so many problems in the world right now as far as food shortages, and we've seen what China has done buying up, you know, farmland here in the, in the in the United States. But what if something was to happen? Do you have enough food? Are you prepared? Our friends over at My Patriot Supply want to help out. The website is prep2023.com. That's prep. 2023.com. Go check it out. They've got a great uh, four-week supply, I believe, that has gives you 2,000 calories uh, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Go check it out. My Patriot Supply, the website, Prep 2023, and be prepared. It's great to be safe, then sorry for sure. Also, check out the Trumpinator. I know we talked about that earlier. If you've got somebody in your life that likes to collect Trump stuff, this is a one-of-a-kind type of deal. This will sell out this broadcast. So go check it out, the Trumpinator, uh, and, and put it in your office. Put it in your home, or if you got a plane, put it on your, the dashboard of your plane like we saw on Trump Force One. Go check it out, the Trumpinator, and make that happen uh, today. All right, let me step aside as we are probably about three minutes away from this happening. We've got a program on playing on stage right now. And I want to remind everybody, 7 o'clock, former Governor Mike Huckabee will take the stage along with President Trump at 9, I'm sorry, 7.30 local time. He'll take the stage. You're so glad you're joining us. If you want to, you can follow me on social media, at Brian Glenn TV, at Brian Glenn TV. Follow us. Uh, and you can, you know, stay. I'll try to tweet as much as I can. Uh, of what's going on right now out here. Sometimes the service is a little bit sketchy, but I'll try to give you some behind the scenes stuff. So at Brian Glenn TV, at Brian Glenn TV on Instagram as well, and at Brian on Truth Social. We're glad you're joining us uh, tonight. Beautiful night in our nation's capital as we are making our way to the dinner here starting shortly. Uh, I'm sure they're going to have, uh, they're going to introduce some of the people on stage, special guests, I would believe, of uh, Ralph Reed, who is the director of um, the Faith and Freedom Coalition. Great organization. I encourage you to go to the website as well. 
Faith and Freedom Coalition. All right, we're going to take it over to the big stage, watch a video. We are live. Thanks for joining us on this Saturday night here at our nation's capital. All right, we're getting the uh, final warning here to silent your devices. Uh, programming note, uh, we will be live up in Michigan uh, for a special dinner. That is tomorrow night. Uh, look forward to that. Plus, we'll be uh, in New Hampshire for a lunch, a women's lunch. Like I said, go to our website, rsbnetwork.com, rsbnetwork.com for all of our programming notes so that you can stay in touch on all things that are going on right now. All right, take it over to this We're live here at the Faith and Freedom. Please welcome Bishop Juan Carlos Mendez, Chairman of the Texas Faith and Freedom Coalition, Don Garner, Chairwoman of the West Virginia Faith and Freedom Coalition, Andrea Garrett, Faith and Freedom Coalition Director of Marketing and Events, Joy Creesman. Faith and Freedom Coalition Hispanic Division Director, Nisa Alvarez. Director of Legislative Affairs for Iowa Faith and Freedom Coalition, Jeff Pitts. Executive Director of Tennessee Faith and Freedom Coalition, Aaron Gulbrinson. Mrs. Tracy Garner. Executive Director of the California Faith and Freedom Coalition, Chad Schnitger. Faith and Freedom Coalition Strategist of African American Engagement, Maggie Nicholas. Executive Director of the North Carolina Faith and Freedom Coalition, Jason Williams. Executive Director of the Georgia Faith and Freedom Coalition, Mac Parnell. Former candidate for governor of Arizona, Carrie Lake. Founder and chairman of American Target Advertising, Richard Vigory. Executive director of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, Timothy Head. Former Arkansas State Representative, Jonathan Barnett. Mrs. Joanne Reed. Former Governor of Arkansas, Mike Huckabee. South Carolina Senator, Lindsey Graham. And Chairman and Founder of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, Ralph Reed. Hello, Faith and Freedom. Welcome to the 2023 Gala. Are you guys ready to have a good time tonight? Have you enjoyed this conference? The eyes of America have been on the Washington Hilton. And when we had the spontaneous worship service last night in the piano bar, it went viral all over the world, ladies and gentlemen. And every single announced candidate for President of the United States has been here this weekend. With the exception of one. And he is en route and Trump Force One is about to land. All right, now I, I know that some of you have violated protocol and have started eating. I can hear the rattling of silverware and plateware. 
But what we're going to do is we're going to pray for the food that has already entered your stomach. <laughs> and I am going to call to the podium to give us our invocation tonight, Bishop Juan Carlos Mendez, who is the Bishop of Baptist Churches in Los Angeles County and recently led a protest of 15,000 Christians and a prayer vigil against the Los Angeles Dodgers honoring the anti-Catholic <laughs> drag queen nuns at Dodger Stadium. He is a great American. He is a champion for our values and for our Lord Jesus Christ. Please welcome Bishop Mendez. You know, our Lord admonished his disciples for not praying for at least an hour. But I, I, I think that we'll have a special dispensation tonight, and I won't pray for an hour with you. So let us go to the Lord. With... Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing this wonderful group of, of Christians together for such a time as this. Lord, thank you for the vision of our brother Ralph Reed and, and for all the team members who have made this event such a successful event. Thank you for all the speakers. And Lord, thank you for the food we're about to receive and for those that have already um, started uh, eating. Lord, we pray that uh, they won't get a stomach ache. Or, <laughs> Lord, thank you for this evening and bless this food in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Let's have a great time. We are going to have a great program for you. It's going to begin in just a little bit. In the meantime, enjoy your meal. We'll be back in a little bit. Uh, Road to Majority. This is uh, day two. This is the nightcap of all of this. Or earlier today, we had some great speakers that took the stage to deliver uh, some inspirational messages, all based around faith, freedom, hope, and the love of country. To kind of recap, uh, today it was uh, kicked off by Nick Adams. He's an author and uh, personality, conservative personality. Uh, got a new book out. I'll if you go to my Twitter page, I'll be able to show that to you. Uh, I kicked it off talking about the importance of men in our in society, men, strong leaders in our culture, in our government. And then it was wrapped up by uh, Judge Jeanine Pirro, which was a incredible. Uh, I, matter of fact, I you know we've all kind of known her from Fox News contributing on The Five and, and her own uh, show on Sundays and in, as a, you know, a, a conservative, obviously a, a judge, but a very conservative uh, influencer, if you will, uh, really lit into some of the problems that we have today. And she has a book um, as well. Uh, so it's been a great day. Uh, we've also had um, Nikki Haley on the, on the stage. We've had Carrie Lake, uh, Benny Johnson, John Solomon, Todd Starnes, uh, Representative uh, Barry Loudermilk uh, from Georgia has been on here as well. So we've had a great day of uh, conservative conversation about love of country and really just, you know, getting back to, you know, the, the, the biblical principles that have made our, our country a, a, as good as it is now. And we need to make sure that we maintain uh, Judeo-Christian values in our culture and the decay that we're seeing uh, pushed out of our schools and basically you know, pushed out of our government, uh, how corporations have bent a knee to the left and some of the woke agendas has really hurt us. And um, we, we can talk, you know, we can joke about what has happened to Bud Light in, in, as a reaction to this a woke agenda being, you know, basically uh, spoon-fed to us, but it's it's far more damaging than that. It kind of goes into the uh, the Scholastic, the education system, universities. We had um, 
Ryan from Liberty U on talking a little bit about that as well as the importance of of education and making sure that we um, have an education system that we actually teach uh, kids something that can be uh, brought on and 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 and. and you know, they can go out into the real world and, and make a living instead of some of these uh, curriculums that are, and these degrees that are that are only, uh, I guess, m- makes the student feel good that they're doing something from a social aspect, but they don't really have any real world applications as far as trying to make a living. Uh, so it is important, in, and we're great, very grateful for Ryan from Liberty U to come on with us. As you can tell, there's a stage. Let's see if we can push in on some of these individuals. I know Carrie Lake is up there. Uh, Ralph Reed is up there uh, as well. Uh, Enjoying a little bit of dinner before it starts. But that's what you have on a Saturday night here. And the significance of this building, by the way, and this this is kind of where the, uh, the, the, the White House Correspondents Dinner is in this room. And I would would probably guess that uh, what you're looking at is where, you know, the, the press correspondents would absolutely be seated uh, during these events. So this, this hotel significance back in uh, March 30th of 1981 is when there was a presidential assassination attempt on President Ronald Reagan right outside the building here back on March 30th of 1981. That's the significance of this hotel, but we're glad you're joining us uh, today on day two of this uh, wonderful, wonderful event, and we look forward to following some of these um, events as they move forward around the country. I know there's one, I think, scheduled in Iowa coming up. We'll make sure that we uh, cover that as well. We've gone over a lot of topics here, and I was just checking some of my messages on social media, asking me uh, to kind of, once again, kind of recap what they can do to make sure that we uh, push the right conservatives in office and we get rid of the ones that are basically standing in the way of allowing conservative values and their agenda to be moved forward. And so a lot of people are asking me what they can do. So I'm just going to tell you right now, you're going to have to call your congressman, your Call them up in your local districts there, or you can call them on the main number here in, in our in our nation's capital. But call them and put pressure on them to support the articles of impeachment on Joe Biden. There is absolutely zero excuse why while that should not happen, and that has been the number one thing I've gotten on social media about that. That people really can't believe that these things have not been supported like they should be and of course we've got you know representatives telling you know the press and telling other members that their constituents in their district don't support it and i just can't understand why anyone would think that that is true and if that is in fact true then i expect these representatives to hold a press conference in their district and tell their constituents that they choose to not vote for the articles of impeachment on Joe Biden. And let's see how that works out. Because I remind you, basically, eight out of ten uh, Republicans who backed the articles of impeachment on President Trump from the Ukraine, there was two of them, they're no longer in office. So let's see if they really, really uh, feel that these articles of impeachment on Joe Biden is something that should not happen. So let's let's put the fire. Let's let's put the fire to them because that is the only way we are going to be able to root out the conservatives in our party that not only put America first, but they put God first as well. And that's one way we can do it because we have seen such a fraction, uh, a fractured, I should say, conference. You know, one thing that the Democrats do, and they do fairly well is they stick together they unite behind a common cause and uh granted i don't think any of us could stand or stomach uh, nancy pelosi but nancy pelosi was a very effective speaker of the house she really uh kept the party unified 
and kept them focused on what they needed to accomplish. And I'll give you an example. Uh, they did a lot of basic verbal voting, just just saying, just voting out loud for the bills, and they would pass bill after bill after bill after bill without any accountability, without having you know basically a, a, a roll call, if you will, on the votes, and making people put uh, their name on the line, makes them be public about voting for a specific bill. But the Democrats did an excellent job getting their agenda done. And the, right now, the Republicans, we've got the House Freedom Caucus fighting with other people, other members in Congress. You've got people that are still upset about the speaker race. You've got people that are still upset that Kevin McCarthy's speaker, although we've gotten five great things passed under his leadership, you've got so much division in the Republican Party that it is so unhealthy that when it comes to uniting against something like in the impeachment of Joe Biden, Christopher Ray, Merrick Garland, uh, Mayorkas, Matthew Graves, uh, we can't get it done because we're too busy fighting one another for political purposes for whatever reason. Now, let me go back on Matthew Graves for a second. That is a local district attorney who is in charge of prosecuting uh, J Sixers, and he is focused entirely on prosecuting people for January 6th. And I'm not talking about people who violently interacted with police. Now, the people who did that deserve to get the full extent of the law, and I don't think any of any one of us can argue that. But there is a handful of people, and it's growing by the month, it seems like. There's more and more people are being put on some type of watch list for simply walking in the Capitol uh, being getting caught up kind of in the in the frenzy of everything people that grandmothers who've walked in the Capitol to take some pictures they walk out next thing you know they're on the FBI wanted list and they're being brought in by Matthew Graves this individual needs to be impeached that is on the table Christopher Ray we've seen the weaponization of the FBI the DOJ why are we allowing that to happen and so many so many of you have reached out to us and said what can be done I'm telling you what can be done. You support these articles of impeachment and send a message that we are not going to tolerate a two-tier justice system. So if we do nothing, we allow it to happen. Now, that's why I think the 2024 presidential election is so important that not only do we take back the White House, but we've got to get the Senate. We've got to get some good candidates in the Senate. Now, I'm not saying that we lost races because you know uh, we didn't have the right candidate. I think there was some probably um, some problems in the election system then, but we cannot let we cannot let the Senate again slip away to the Democrats. We can't. We got to hold the House and get the presidency to turn this country around. It's the only thing that we can do. Let me step aside, set the scene for you. As a reminder, go to our website, follow us on social media. RSBnetwork.com, RSBnetwork.com. Subscribe to the newsletter, donate, check out our program schedule. We got a lot of stuff going on. We're going to be all over the country in the next couple of days, without a doubt. We're heading up, uh, really tomorrow, for the Oakland County GOP Lincoln Day dinner with Donald J. Trump. Uh, he was going to receive an award there. And it's going to be likely a sold-out event, but we'll be up there. Uh, Vanessa Broussard will be there as well, covering that. And then we're going to transition over to Moms for Liberty. Now, this is a great event in Philadelphia. We heard Ryan from Liberty University talk a little bit about that earlier. But that's going to be a great um, event. Then we're going to Concord, New Hampshire. That's right. For the New Hampshire Federation of Republican Women will host their largest and probably most successful 76th annual Little Act Luncheon featuring your favorite president, President Donald J. Trump. That will be a sold-out crowd as well. We look forward to that. Looks like someone's coming to the podium here shortly as we are scheduled to start at 7 p.m. tonight, and we probably anticipate President Trump coming on sometime between 7.30 and 8 o'clock, depending on the flow of the schedule now. But we're glad you're joining us on this beautiful Saturday night uh, in our nation's capital. And then we're going to wrap it up. Guess what? We're going back down to South Carolina. We're going to Pickens, 
South Carolina for a great rally. Now this rally is going to be a little different than what we've seen in the past. It's going to be on Main Street, along the city streets, and the downtown Pickens. It's going to be a very unique setting from what I've been told. I can't wait for it. Uh, it's going to be a special event. We'll kick off our coverage uh, probably around noon, their local time. Can't wait to do that. Looks like Ralph Reed is stepping up. We're live. Faith and Freedom, Road to Majority. You can continue to enjoy your meals, but I would ask you to please direct your attention to the main stage because it is our great honor to welcome to the podium now and to our stage the international recording artist, Giera, who is a human rights advocate, a radio host, and has opened for Donald Trump in Mar-a-Lago and all over the country. If you go on YouTube, she has millions and millions of views, and she continues to help lift up the message of human rights and liberty and freedom and faith around the world. Please join me in welcoming recording artist Giera. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful intro. I am very honored to be here with all of you tonight in the presence of fellow freedom fighters. And I want you to know that I've written some brand new music. You will be the first to hear it tonight, the first of which is called One Nation Under God.
Thank you. Thank you so much. I have another brand, one, brand new one for you. So this next song is very powerful. It's called Battle Cry. And I want you to know that I believe the people in this room know how to fight for our freedoms and how to save this country and how to do it through faith and humanity and wisdom to raise our voices and to march peacefully for what we believe in. So this is, thank you. This is a call to arms and it is called Battle Cry. You ought to discover some principle. You ought to have some great faith that grips you so much that you will never give it up because it has gripped you so much that you are willing to die for it if necessary. If you have never found something so dear and so precious to you that you will die for it, then you aren't fit to live. You died when you refused to stand up for right. You died when you refused to stand up for truth. You died when you refused to stand up for justice. Left, right, left, right. Yes, we are prepared to fight. Everybody fall in line. Now you hear the battle cry. Left, right, left, right. Yes, we are prepared to fight. Thank you so much. You are the first human beings to ever hear those songs. <laughs> I have one more for you tonight, and um, this one's very special to me. It's uh, the quote of my favorite president. It is called, The Best is Yet to Come. I, uh, I actually wrote this song a while ago, and the truth is I didn't, I didn't record it. And the day I decided to get in the studio and record it and get it all done, I finished it at 3 p.m., and that night at 6 p.m., he announced that he was going to run for presidency again. So, uh, so there you go. And I do believe in this message, because although I think that there are times when the world can seem like it's going upside down, I do not believe in that. I believe that some long-laid evil is finally coming to light, and people are finally seeing it and waking up, 
and I truly believe that the best is yet to come. And if anyone wants to sing, I know we got some singers out there because I heard you last night. So if you catch the chorus, feel free to start a revival with me up here. <laughs> Come on, I know you can harmonize out there. Yeah. Groping, so much aching in my heart But I knew I couldn't give up Even though it might be hard Then I saw the light break through the clouds And I heard the voices crying out Telling me it wasn't over yet And I started to believe over but we've got a ways to go if we march on together i absolutely know that there ain't nothing can stop us no matter what gets in our way but when it all is feeling too hard i'm reminded of the day when i saw the light break through the clouds and i heard the voices cry Thank you so much. I might throw something on you, Ralph. A little birdie told me that it's Ralph Reed's birthday today. <laughs> Will you please join me in singing happy birthday to Ralph Reed? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ralph. to you. Tierra, <laughs> everybody. Let's thank her. What a great talent. And we planned it this way. We planned it so that the last day would be on my birthday. <laughs> and I want you to reflect on this for a minute. For the rest of my life and for all eternity, the anniversary of the overturning of Roe v. Wade is going to happen on my birthday. 
<laughs> That's not a bad birthday present, is it? We are now going to present the Ronald Reagan Leadership Award, but before we do, we want to direct your attention to the Jumbotrons for a video we're going to show. I've known Richard Vigory for about 40 years. He's one of the genuine pioneers of modern American politics. The fact is, he really invented the use of direct mail by Republicans and by conservatives. He funded the entire rise of the conservative movement in the 70s. He was a strategic leader about ideas, about campaigns, and about what conservatism should be all about. And he's retained his excitement, his interest, his patriotism, and his commitment to the cause of conservatism for all of these years. Uh, I think it's great that he's being recognized because he is a genuine pioneer. Somebody who went out, figured out some very complicated things, worked out how to get them to work, and then applied them to a cause he believed in, a cause that I'm proud to have worked with him on, the cause of conservatism in America. So, Richard, congratulations. I think it is very fitting tonight that we present the Ronald Reagan Leadership Award to Richard Vigory. Because while Ronald Reagan provided the prophetic voice, there is no question that Richard Vigory was the founding funder of the modern conservative movement. He was literally present at creation shortly after Bill Buckley and a group founded Young Americans for Freedom in 1960. He was one of the first executive directors, helped build that organization, helped lay the foundation for the volunteer network for the Barry Goldwater campaign in 1964. And in 1965, after that defeat, when many people thought the Republican Party was finished and dead, he founded the Vigory Company. And it began when he went to the Secretary of the US Senate office and copied by longhand the names of 12,500 Goldwater donors. That was the beginning of an effort to bypass both the Republican establishment and the liberal media by building a vast network of organizations that constituted the modern conservative movement and bypassing the leadership elites by going after small grassroots donors. In the next 58 years, he has mailed over 4 billion letters. He has raised over $7 billion for conservative and Christian causes. He has generated, he has generated over 75 million donations to conservative and Christian organizations and has built a gold-plated list of over 10 million conservative donors today. He's raised money for organizations and helped launch organizations ranging from American Conservative Union to Moral Majority to National Right to Work to NICPAC, the National Conservative Political Action Committee, to the Moral Majority, and to Faith and Freedom Coalition and Hillsdale College. Richard Vigory was one of the first people I called when I founded Faith and Freedom Coalition in 2009. He has partnered with us to build a donor and support base of over 2.7 million donors and activists and supporters all across this country. Today we face a very similar challenge. We face a big challenge of, on Act Blue, the liberal online donor platform, over 83 million donations in 2022 compared to only 30 million Republican or conservative donations, and the liberal and Democratic candidates raised over $2.2 billion online to only a billion for Republican candidates. We're only going to be able to bridge that gap by doing the kinds of things today that Richard Vigory has done throughout his career. He is my friend, my collaborator, and for over a half century, 
He has devoted his entire adult life to building this movement, and that is why we are honored on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Faith and Freedom Coalition to present Richard Vigory with our Ronald Reagan Leadership Award. <laughs> Richard, please come up. Thank you. Uh, because of what Ralph said, I'll just say quickly, my role model is uh, Moses, Deuteronomy 34, verse 7. And Moses lived to be 120, and his eye was not dim, nor his vital forces abated. <laughs> I, I, I tell the liberals, look out, Vigory is just getting started, okay? <laughs> Ralph, I can't think of the words to adequately express my gratitude for this great honor. I'm really humbled to receive the Ronald Reagan Leadership Award that my name appears alongside Phyllis Schlafly, Beverly LaHaye, Bill Bennett, Drs. Jim Dobson, Pat Robinson. That's something of dreams. And Ralph, when I wake up from this dream, I'm not giving it back. Okay? <laughs> uh, in a few minutes, Ralph said uh, four, but I'm going to take maybe a second longer. I've been given this evening, I want to import one really big idea that's necessary to save the America we know and love. I can turn the pages here. The leadership of every major institution in America is arrayed against our views and values. They're all involved in censoring the news, and we know that. Big tech, big media, Hollywood, entertainment, radio national radio, TV, the nonprofit community, the legal community, higher and lower education, big business, Wall Street, unions, organized religion, etc. The list includes our own government, the FBI, the CIA, the IRS, now the Department of Justice. Today, it's important to recognize people that we're in a spiritual civil war. The left is launched against Western civilization, America, our constitution, Judeo-Christian moral values, and much else we value and hold. Unfortunately, the enemy, the socialists, the Marxists are winning. What's to be done? First and foremost, pray, pray, pray. What's, what's to be done? Second, get engaged, help lead. On April 19, 1775, at Lexington and Concord, shots were fired to heard around the world, and the fight for our freedoms from Great Britain was underway. However, there was something really important that happened that day you may not be aware of. You've all read in school and beyond, but at the end of that day, thousands and thousands of patriots had joined the fight, firing at the British troops behind trees and stone walls. But did you know that there was no military leader in charge that day? No one giving orders. Every patriot was a leader that day. They each rushed to the sound of the guns that they heard. So don't wait for instructions from Ralph Reed, Donald Trump, Tucker Carlson. Rush to the sound of the guns you hear. Pick yourself to lead. In 2004, Barack Obama self-described himself as a community organizer. Five years later, that community organizer was president of the United States. People didn't beat down his door to get him to run for president. He picked himself, as you can pick yourself to lead. In 2015, a businessman with no prior government experience, Donald Trump, picked himself to run for president. 20 months later, he's president of the United States. Today, our tools are not the muskets of the April 19, 1775 patriots, but they're our voices, our phones, email, talk radio, blogs, podcasts, cable television, websites, videos, social media, nonprofit organizations such as Faith and Freedom. Look at what Ralph Reed has, and others have done at Faith and Freedom Coalition. They've uh, they boxed way above their, their weight. They've 
box in the heavyweight division, and so can you. Professor Harry Jaffa from the Claremont Institute brilliantly said a few years ago, Western civilization survives because of America. He said also, America survives because of the conservative movement. The conservative movement survives because of a few hundred conservative leaders, donors, and activists. Many are in this room tonight. Each of us owes it to our children, our grandchildren, and generations unborn to get out of our comfort zone each day and become the leaders we've been waiting for. Courage is contagious. Courage is infectious. Courage begets courage. So when you show courage and step out and provide leadership, it'll encourage your family members, friends, neighbors, others, co-workers, uh, church members to follow. Some of you can financially help existing organizations. Others can start organizations. You can become a political candidate. You can uh, support nonprofits. You can mentor young people. You can, uh, as a lawyer, an accountant, a business person, you can volunteer your expertise to organizations or political candidates. Some can mentor young people. Others can start a blog. There are many, many things you can do. You can tweet. You can forward videos. So all of us can be leaders, and all of us must do some of these things. To quote Ronald Reagan, if not us, who? If not now, when? People, we've got a country to save, and it starts with each and every one of you and us. Thank you again. Ralph, for this spectacular award, uh, and thank Freedom, Faith and Freedom Coalition. I'm humbled and greatly appreciative. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. See you on the battlefield of the spiritual civil war, and don't be late. <laughs>
I want God to be pleased. I'm living for what He says of me, not what other people say about me. We had a very special person to him and to us who couldn't be here tonight. He sees her quite often, but she succeeded him as governor of Arkansas. And my, your, your daughter, Sarah, has recorded a video that we're going to play for you now. Hello, Faith and Freedom Coalition. It's an honor to address this year's gala and to congratulate my dad on receiving the Winston Churchill Lifetime Achievement Award. My dad is an all-American success story. From our family's church in Texarkana to the Arkansas governor's mansion to a Republican presidential frontrunner. Throughout his journey, he never ever forgot the faith and values that ground him. He and my mom taught me my favorite Bible verse, which I still carry close to my heart, Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. That lesson brought my dad close to Americans in Arkansas, Iowa, and beyond. It's what makes him such a great dad, grandfather, and governor. Many people think he's the best governor our country's ever seen, although I'm angling to take that title away from him soon. And more than anything, it's what's given him the strength to defend faith and freedom, no matter the odds. We can all only hope to live up to his wonderful life. Thank you all for honoring my dad with this award. For his fortitude in the face of overwhelming opposition, he is the true embodiment of Winston Churchill's legacy. And thank you for gathering for this year's gala to win back America for faith and freedom. There's no more important mission in this country. Enjoy your conference and God bless. Thank you, Governor Huckabee, for that message. And now I'm, I'm really pleased to welcome to the podium a man to deliver a testimony about Mike and his life who has known Mike longer than anybody else in this room really longer than just about anybody. He's known Mike since they were both 16 years old. And they met at Arkansas Boys State. He went on to help uh, lay the foundation for Mike's campaigns. He chaired every one of his campaigns. Today he is the long time serving Arkansas Republican National Committee man. Please welcome to the podium, Jonathan Barnett from Arkansas. Wow, it's good to be with you all here this evening. After all that, they didn't tell me they were going to do all that preview before me. I thought I was going to get to say all that. But anyhow, my name is Jonathan Barnett, and I'm from a place called Salem Springs, Arkansas. I first met my good friend Mike Huckabee 51 years ago in 1972 at the Arkansas American Legion Boys State Program. And even at 16, as a 16-year-old teenager, Mike had a unique ability to communicate. It was evident that my new friend from Hope, Arkansas, had God-given gifts and talents that not all of us are blessed with. And yes, Mike Huckabee is from Hope. And even way back then, I thought that Mike could become president of the United States one day. Since I was involved with teenage Republicans, I told Mike that someday I was going to run him for public office, and his response to me was, Jonathan, I am called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Later that summer, Mike and I went to Expo 72 in Dallas, Texas, which the movie The Jesus Revolution has highlighted. We were inspired by the ministry of Bill Bright with the Campus Crusade for Christ, Billy Graham, in the gospel music of Johnny Cash and Chris Christopherson. Mike, I think that you might have picked up a thing or two from those four gentlemen. By the way, there was a kind of a Jesus movement in the lobby last night about 10 o'clock. I don't know if anybody saw that. 
went on for about an hour, and I was young, the old, it was, if you missed it, you really missed something. I think it started here. Mike went on to serve as senior pastor at two large Baptist churches in southern Arkansas for many years. All the while, I continued to look for an opportunity to get Mike involved in politics. And then in 1992, the phone call came from Mike that he was ready to run for the United States Senate from Arkansas. The incumbent was none other than former governor and now three-term incumbent Democrat Dale Bumpers, Senator Dale Bumpers, who had encouraged Mike to run for office years before when Mike was elected governor of Boy State. Interesting fact. During his Senate race, Mike and I were invited to the Reagan Library where Nancy and Ronald Reagan hosted a fundraiser for Mike's campaign. Now, how many people have been able to do that? I noticed that outside this hall, outside the building here, is where Ronald Reagan was shot uh, many years ago by John Buckley, Jr. Unfortunately, Mike did not win that race, but as you well know, Bill Clinton did win his bid for the presidency that year. That opened up new doors in Arkansas. The state was ready to elect a Republican, and Mike ran for lieutenant governor, and he won. Through the course of Whitewater and some political indictments, Mike Huckabee became governor, serving 10 and a half years at a time of total Democrat dominance in the state of Arkansas, and he became one of the longest serving governors in our state's history. In 2008, Mike ran for president of the United States and won the Iowa caucus and came in second in the nomination process to John McCain. And Mike, I'm convinced that if you would have run in 2012, you would have won the presidency of the United States. <laughs> Mike ran again in 2016, but dropped out after the Iowa caucus and our efforts then redirected to help and elect then candidate Donald J. Trump. It was also, it was also at that time that his daughter Sarah became actively involved in the Trump campaign. Even though Mike has not yet become president, his influence on America has been enormous. He's possibly been even much more effective as a public figure than as president. He has been a constant voice of traditional conservative values with a godly perspective for many years on radio, television, social media, and public speaking. Mike is also a prolific writer, having authored more than 14 books. He's well known as a friend to Israel and has traveled to the Holy Lands at least once a year in his entire adult life. Mike has a strong moral compass. His knowledge of the Bible and his personal relationship with Jesus Christ have equipped him not only to live out his faith, but to articulate godly values to America. No one has stood up more for the unborn in the pro-life movement in America than Mike Huckabee. Mike is very loyal. That's a rare quality in politics today, but Mike has always remembered where he came from and who his true friends are, and he's never forsaken them, even though their paths may have gone different directions. Mike is full of common sense. He brings a sound perspective into the early conversation and into every situation. Mike makes tough decisions easy by just doing what is right. The thing about Mike is he stands his ground, and, you, and what you see is what you get. Mike's a family man. He's a devoted husband to Janet, his wife, of 49 years, and together they have raised three great kids and blessed to have seven grandchildren, always including his family in all of his endeavors and providing a great role model for public service. His influence on his daughter, Sarah, has led her to having as many or more opportunities than he has ever had. Sarah Huckabee Sanders used to be known as Mike Huckabee's daughter. Today, Mike Huckabee is known as Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders' father. <laughs> that
They are the only father-daughter governors to ever serve in the United States of America. Mike, you're like a brother to me, and uh, you're a dear friend to everyone in this room. Mike, congratulations on this award. Well deserved. Thank you for letting me be your friend. You know, I, um, there's so many things that I could say about Mike before I bring him up here to receive his award. You've already heard some of it in the video and what Jonathan said and what Sarah said. Uh, what a remarkable career. An early aid to evangelist James Robeson, a broadcaster, a pastor, chairman of the Arkansas Baptist Convention. And, uh, but I first got to know Mike when we were building the Christian Coalition in the very early years, and I was in, um, I think Mike was going to tell this story, but sorry, Mike, you're going to have to tell a different story, because I'm going <laughs> to tell a little bit of it. I was in Jonesboro, Arkansas in late 1991, and we were teaching a fieldman training seminar. Yeah, that's right. In 1991, and we were teaching a fieldman training seminar. And one of the speakers was Mike Huckabee, who was then running against Dale Bumpers uh, for U.S. Senate. And uh, our state leader at the time said, hey, why don't we get together after the seminar and visit with Mike and talk about the campaign? And we stayed up until about 1 o'clock in the morning with Mike sitting around. And I'll never forget, he had a legal pad on his lap, and he was writing out on the legal pad how he was going to get elected to the U.S. Senate. And I remember walking out of there, and I went, you know, it's so sad that this nice guy thinks he's going to win this campaign. Because <laughs> I think Dale Bumpers is going to be hard to beat. But I was so impressed by him. I was so impressed by his heart, by his patriotism, by his energy. Uh, I just thought that he was a star. And I've sized up a lot of political horse flesh in my career. And I know it when I see it. And this was a very special person. Well, he didn't go on to win that campaign, but Bill Clinton won that November of 1992, and that meant that his lieutenant governor, Jim Guy Tucker, rose to the governorship, and there was now a vacancy for lieutenant governor. And Mike was urged to run for lieutenant governor against one of Bill Clinton's top aides, a guy named Nate Coulter. And we swung into action put about a quarter of a million voter guides into churches, knocked on doors, uh, hung door hangers. And I can't remember how late it was, Mike, but it was either very late that night or early that morning that I got a phone call from our state chairman in Arkansas saying, you are not going to believe this, but Mike won. He is the Republican lieutenant governor of Arkansas. And I got to go tell Pat Robertson, and we called you from the dressing room. And after that, he never looked back. And he became governor of his state, you may remember, under very difficult circumstances. He united his state. And I think the thing that I like so much about Mike is he's a principled conservative and a Christian statesman who has a rare combination of a flinching commitment to the principles of his faith and his conservative philosophy, while also being a bridge builder and having a very winsome personality that welcomes others to the rank of our movement. And there are so many moments in his career, I'm sure for you and I, whether as governor or as one of the top broadcasters in America, at Fox News and now at Trinity Broadcasting or during his presidential campaigns when he said something into a camera and you were so proud that he was representing you. This is a man who's given his entire adult life to the church, to the cause of Christ, and to the pro-family movement. He's gone anywhere he was needed, campaigning for candidates, coming to events like this, 
even helping to start local chapters of pro-family organizations. He is given to this movement, and tonight it is a great honor for us, Mike, on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Faith and Freedom Coalition to give back to you, to recognize you and honor you with our highest award, the Winston Churchill Lifetime Achievement Award. Please welcome <laughs> Governor Mike Huckabee. Thank you very much. You scared me when you stood up. I thought you were all leaving. <laughs> I was thrilled to death when I was told I was going to get the Lifetime Achievement Award until I started thinking about In most organizations, if you get a Lifetime Achievement Award, they give it to you when you are old and frail and you have to be wheeled in or helped to the podium and somebody has to hand you something to say. You know, kind of like Joe Biden. <laughs> so I'm really glad that I'm actually going to remember that I was here, and that's very special. And I'll bet you anything, when I'm finished, I can find my own way back to my chair without <laughs> Ralph having to come get me. I'm not going to tell you that I'm humbled by the award, because quite frankly, if I told you that I was humbled, you might think, oh, well, then we'll take it back. <laughs> it, it's like the fellow who was given his church's humility award but they took it from him because he had the audacity to accept it. <laughs> so I'm accepting this because I'm honored, and I'm honored to be with you. You really are my kind of people, and you have been for my entire life. <laughs> I'm deeply grateful to my longtime friend, Jonathan Barnett, who blessed me with his presence tonight and the wonderful and kind words that he had to say. I'm obviously overwhelmed. I did not know that Sarah had done a video for this and that, uh, you know, tugged at the old man's heart. I, I do remember when I would go to places and they would read all this biographical stuff about me and now I go to make a speech and my introduction is very brief. All they say is, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sarah's dad. That's it. <laughs> People ask me all the time, how did Sarah get to be so tough? I always say, have you ever met her mother? <laughs> you notice her mother's not here tonight, and that's why I could tell you that. <laughs> the truth is, she had two older brothers who were incredibly mean to her. Like most older brothers are. Sarah is the youngest of our three, the only girl. She had brothers that went out of their way to be hateful. I mean, I'm not kidding. When she was two years old, they super glued her fingers together one night, <laughs> which required a trip to the emergency room to separate them. Not long after that, they gave her a big glass of mud and told her it was a chocolate milkshake from the Dairy Queen. <laughs> and not long after that, the kid realized that if she was going to survive much of life, she was going to have to learn to fight back. And boy, did she ever. And I'm glad she did. I'm proud of all of my children. Only one of them has decided they wanted to be in the public eye, and I think she's doing an exceptional job. But then again, I'm about as objective about my daughter as the New York Times is about Donald Trump, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Except I love my daughter, and the New York Times, I don't think they like the president very much. But that's okay, because I do, and I'll make up for what they don't like, and I'm excited that he's going to be here tonight. I obviously did not make it to the White House, but I am very happy to try to help some people who have, and I hope who will, 
who understand that the battle that we're facing in this country is not a political battle, and it's not an economic fight, and it's not a sociological fight. It is a spiritual battle between the forces of evil and good. It truly is. We are long past the days when Democrats and Republicans had differences, but they they didn't hate each other and they could work together. We're living in a time now where the sides are divided, again, not by their political ideologies, but in some cases, as my daughter, I think so brilliantly put it in a response to the State of the Union, we're now dealing between normal and crazy. And when we have people who advocate the mutilation of children and believe that that's okay, and that we ought to all stand up and salute that. And I'm thinking we don't let children get tattoos, join the military, get married, enter into contracts. We don't let them drive cars, drink liver, uh, liquor, or smoke cigarettes. Why? Because they're too young to understand the irreparable harm that can come from some of those habits. And yet we have an entire political movement built on the notion that a seven-year-old ought to be able to make a decision that has irreversible consequences. And that's why this battle is not political. Let's not pretend that it is. Politics is a means by which we can steer the country back to its roots of elevating freedom for all, but also elevating an absolute understanding that this country cannot exist without a belief that beyond our own human understanding, God created the heavens and the earth and us. And for us to believe that God has a right to make the rules, he is the tuning fork to which all of us must tune our instrument. And it is not that we need to tune to the culture so we can sit at the cool kids table. It's that we need to tune the culture to the historic, everlasting, and unchanging truths that are found in the Word of God. And that's why this movement becomes so very, very important. I remember very vividly the first meeting I had with Ralph in Jonesboro, Arkansas that he described a few moments ago. I also vividly remember how young he looked and I now think about how disgusting it is that he still looks <laughs> so very young. I know he had a birthday today, but I think he skipped the last 30. <laughs> he truly is the Pat Boone of the Christian evangelical movement, without a doubt. And I appreciate him very much for all that he does, all that he stands for, and the consistency of his leadership through the 32 plus years in which I've known him. And I'm grateful to be able to stand on the same stage with him and with President Trump, with Richard Viguerie, who has been such a pioneer for the cause, and to be able to express to you, the foot soldiers of the fight, thank you. And let's not give up, because the battle is not over. Folks, it's just getting started. Thank you and God bless. Well, it's been an amazing weekend. And we've had every announced candidate here except one. And I am pleased to tell you that the 45th President of the United States is in the House. <laughs> he is, this is, hang on, wait till he gets here. This is his eighth appearance at Road to Majority. He is no stranger to this stage. He has been a friend of this organization 
from its beginnings. And before he comes out, I want to direct you to a video that will show before he comes out on stage. Right now, the conference board probability of recession over the next 12 months is 99%. You know, the rapidly rising... Uh, you um, can see it on the sign. 569 a gallon. And prices will only go up. I'm going to digress slightly. Like, Images we... like this show the chaotic withdrawal no from way. Afghanistan in we August ever going to unite yes, Ukraine. I mean, excuse me, Iraq, <laughs> Afghanistan. Ukraine is now a nation at war. A growing crisis at the southern border. Groups of hundreds waiting to cross All right. God save the queen, man. We will have 10 million jobs. We will make America into the manufacturing superpower of the world. Donald Trump's focusing on American energy independent. So we're energy independent. We're energy independent. Within six months, we would have been energy dominant. President Trump's pulling the U.S. out of the Iran nuclear deal and imposing tough new sanctions on Iran. The United States no longer makes empty threats. Pro-life advocates have described President Donald Trump as the most pro-life president in U.S. history. Every life brings love into this world. Every child brings joy to a family. I, Brett, and Kavanaugh do solemnly swear. Thank you very much, Mr. President. A federal judge? A federal judge. A federal judge ruled in favor of the administration. In the nation's highest court, ruling to overturn Roe v. Wade. Yesterday, the court handed down a victory for the Constitution. After decades of division and conflict, we mark the dawn of a new Middle East. Embassy to Israel is open tonight in Jerusalem. After being silenced by Facebook and Twitter from Donald Trump said he'll be launching his own social media platform. It's doing uh, far better than I ever thought it could do. We will make America great again for all Americans, greater than ever before. Thank you. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, please welcome the 45th President of the United States, President Donald J. Trump. And I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died, who gave that right to me. And I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today. From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston and New York to LA, where there's pride in every American heart, and it's time we stand and say.
Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. My friends, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's great to be back with so many proud American patriots who believe in God, family, and country. Thank you very much. This is a great group of people. And I want to thank a man of incredible commitment, vision, and devotion, Ralph Reed. And Ralph, I want to wish you a very happy birthday. Very, very, very interesting day to have a birthday, because a big decision came down one year ago today. So that's very interesting. That's very interesting, Ralph. Let me also recognize Faith and Freedom Coalition Executive Director Tim Head. Tim, thank you very much. Tim, wherever you may be. Thank you, Tim. Great job. As well as Senator Lindsey Graham. Lindsey, thank you very much. He's gotten very much more conservative, I have to tell you. Carrie Lake. Yeah. Alveda King. Alveda, wherever you may be. Alveda. Frank Pavone. Frank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations as well to Richard Vigory on receiving the Defender of Freedom Award, a big deal, and to Mike Huckabee, my friend, for a long time, long, long time, getting the Lifetime Achievement Award. I think he's better now than he was 20 years ago. You want to know the truth? I heard what he had to say, but he is not a good example of it. You're in great shape. Thanks, Mike, and thanks for being a friend. I also want to thank a great Politician and a fantastic person running for governor of North Carolina. His endorsement yesterday was amazing. Right? From North Carolina. Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson. That was such an endorsement, it went viral. It was all over the world last night. I think he's going to do quite well. These young ladies followed me. I guess we have, what, 99th? This is your 99th event. And they're from North Carolina, and they're incredible, and they're beautiful, and they happen to be rich, I think. But they're great, and he's going to do very well, Mark, I think, in North Carolina. Last but not least, let me say a very special thanks to all of you that are gathered here, the crowd is incredible, and even outside, it's packed. So something's going on. We do have great poll numbers, you know. We just got some poll numbers. 77 to 23. That was good. That was good. That's against the Republicans and beating Biden by 11. You say, why only 11? How could he possibly do so well? But it's a real mess. Our country's in a horrible situation. Since 2016, Faith and Freedom Coalition volunteers have knocked on 17.8 million doors, reached over 30 million Christian voters in their homes. And last year alone, you reached another 30 million voters in their churches. Incredible job that Ralph and the group do. No group has fought harder in defense of the Judeo-Christian values that we all stand for and uphold, and no group will be more crucial to our magnificent victory on Election Day 2024. So important. That'll be the most important election we've ever had. I said it with 2016, but I say it with 2024. I think even more strongly going to be the most important election this country has ever had, because our country is going to hell. With your help, we're going to evict crooked Joe Biden from the White House. And we're going to take back our country, and we're going to make America great again. For seven years, you and I have been fighting side by side to rescue our country from evil and from the sinister forces who hate it. I believe they hate it, and I believe they actually want to destroy it. Now we're approaching the most important battle of our lives. As we gather today, our beloved nation is teetering on the edge of tyranny. I believe that, and you believe that. Our enemies are waging war on faith and freedom, on science and religion, on history and tradition, on law and democracy, on God Almighty himself. They are waging war. That's not a war they're going to win. The radicals are setting fire to our Constitution. 
abolishing free speech, attacking religious belief, erasing our borders, corrupting our elections, and we have corrupt elections, and trying to impose their blasphemous creed and woke communism on every American man, woman, and child. And that's what they're doing, and they're trying so hard. We've never had a situation like is going on right now in our country. But the people in this room will never let them do it. They'll never let them get away with it, and it's not going to happen. We will not waver in defense of our faith, our freedom, and our great American flag. They don't want the flag either. They don't want anything. They don't want anything that's good. And you wonder why and how did they ever get elected in the first place. It's sick. Together, we're warriors in a righteous crusade to stop the arsonists, the atheists, globalists, and the Marxists. And that's what they are. And we will restore our republic as one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. The menacing specter of left-wing repression has been growing steadily for years and years. It's been growing, and we were stopping it very powerfully for four years, and now it's picked up at a level that nobody's ever seen before. First, they slandered Americans of faith as haters and bigots. Then they corrupted the media. They installed radical left judges to subvert our Constitution. They used the IRS to target conservatives. They spied on our campaign, and specifically, they spied on my campaign, and we caught them. They're terrible. Nobody would have thought. Could you imagine if it was the other way? Could you imagine if, let's say, I spied? Let's not use Biden. Let's use Obama. Let's say, Mike Huckabee, that you and I spied on Obama's campaign. Do you think it would have been fine? You know, this would be, we'd be away for a long time, wouldn't we, huh? They tried to take down a presidency with hoaxes and witch hunts. They're still trying, but we wouldn't let them. And now Joe Biden has weaponized law enforcement to interfere in our elections, the greatest abuse of power that I've seen and that most of you have seen in the history of our country. It's a hoax. Every time the radical left Democrats, Marxists, communists, and fascists indict me, I consider it a great badge of courage. I'm being indicted for you, and I believe the you is more than 200 million people that love our country. They're out there, and they love our country. This is a continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time, which has been fully exposed in the Durham report, the IG report by Inspector General Horowitz did a great job in that report, and by great writers, journalists, and pundits all over the world. And its primary purpose is exactly that, election interference. They want to interfere with the upcoming election. They want to demean, insult, do whatever is necessary to interfere. And as you know, the fake news doesn't report on all of the things that you're reading about and hearing about. You're hearing about things that you can't believe, bigger than Watergate, bigger than anything we've ever seen. And if you look at the New York Times or if you look at the Washington Post or the mainstream media of any kind, ABC, NBC, CBS, not a word of it, not a word, not even a little bit. They want to interfere with the fair and free election to a point where Joe Biden is willing to arrest his opponent, who is leading him in the polls by a very, very large number. They lie, they cheat, and they steal. And this is how low they've fallen in an attempt to win the 2024 election. And we're not going to let that happen. We're not letting it happen. They rigged the presidential election of 2020. We are not going to allow to — we are just not going to allow them to rig the presidential election of 2024. Not going to happen. Charging a former president who did a good job. We had a lot of people that were very happy. There are some people said it was the most consequential presidency. But charging a former president of the United States under the Espionage Act of 1917, that's like making nuclear weapons in your basement, isn't it? <laughs> An act for a crime so heinous that only the death penalty would do. 
is one of the most outrageous and vicious legal theories ever put forward in an American court of law. It's a disgrace. And the people they have doing it are disgraceful. And just look at their record. Disgraceful. The Espionage Act has been used to go after traitors and spies. It has nothing to do with a former president legally keeping his own documents. As a president, the law that applies to this case is not the Espionage Act, as the lawyers will tell you, and they like to tell you, and the press doesn't like to write about it, but the courts of law will see it, and they already know it. But the Presidential Records Act, which is not even mentioned in this ridiculous 44-page, 44 44-page 44 indictment of me. I didn't know about that. You know, when I graduated from the Wharton School of Finance, we didn't study being indicted, getting arrested, <laughs> going to jail. We didn't know about that. They never taught us that. Under the Presidential Records Act, which is civil, not criminal, done in 1977, civil, I had every right to have these documents, personal belongings, and boxes. Joe Biden didn't. Even Mike Pence didn't have that right. They weren't covered by the Presidential Records Act. I was, because I was president, but they weren't. But these scoundrels and thugs, they only come after me. They didn't go after the many, many other presidents that kept their documents. You know about it. Many, many others. If you look at the Bush family, if you look at even Jimmy Carter, and I'd say he's innocent. I say Jimmy Carter's innocent. But they went after me. They didn't go after anybody else. And they went after me criminally. And it's not a criminal violation. It's not even a violation under the Presidential Records Act. And what could be more accurate a statement than Presidential Records Act? That's what we're talking about. <laughs> not espionage. It's not espionage. The crucial legal precedent is laid out in the most important case ever on the subject known as the Clinton Socks case. You know what that means? Socks. <laughs> Let me give you a hint. It has something to do with socks and taking things out in your socks. After leaving the White House, Bill Clinton kept 79 audio tapes in his socks and his sock drawer. So he put them in his sock. I didn't. I put mine in boxes outside of the White House, and the GSA picked them up and delivered them where they were supposed to be delivered. But they included in the Clinton discussions and the Clinton tapes a discussion of U.S. military involvement in Haiti. He can't get away from Haiti, can he? Right? He's done very well with Haiti. Discussions of U.S. foreign policy, both defense and offense, against Cuba. And what about them allowing China to have military bases now in Cuba? I think uh, you're not too happy about that, Mr. Senator. And he's not even saying anything about it. Recording of President Clinton's conversations with foreign leaders. Sensitive facts about trade negotiations taken from presidential briefings. This is all in the tapes. Discussions with Secretary of State about conflict in Bosnia and much, much more. Not only was Bill Clinton never even considered for criminal prosecution based on the tapes he took. And these are tapes he took. These were serious tapes. But when he was sued for them, he won the case. He won it. Judge Amy Berman Jackson's decision states, under the statutory scheme established by the Presidential Records Act. The decision to segregate personal materials from presidential records is made by the president during the president's term and in his sole discretion. Now, this is a Democrat-appointed judge, respected. Any normal administration, even an opposing one, would consider that to be the end. That's the end of the case but not the corrupt Biden regime, because they're trying to win the election. And it's very hard to win an election when you're probably, definitely, I would say definitely, the worst president in the history of our country, without question. The Sox decision, they call it the Sox decision. Also, I quote, it says, the National Archives and Records Administration, or NARA, very radical left group, by the way. They have the Constitution and the Bill of Rights flagged for being dangerous documents. Did you know that? Does not have the authority to designate materials as presidential records. Now, think of that. They don't have the authority. NARA does not have the tapes in question. NARA lacks any right, duty, or means to seize control of those tapes. 
The president enjoys unconstrained authority to make decisions regarding the disposal of documents. Only the president, not vice presidents, not senators. Biden has a lot of documents from his time as a senator. That's bad. And he has a lot of documents from his time as vice president. That's bad. He has 25 or so times the documents I have. He has so many documents. He doesn't know they're coming. They, they keep them on the floor of his garage where he has that really beautiful Corvette, he says. <laughs> Neither the archivist nor Congress has the authority to veto the president's decision. The president can do whatever he wants with it. And this was a big deal, that act. And it was passed in Congress, 1977. The Presidential Records Act does not confer any mandatory or even discretionary authority on the archivist. They have no say whatsoever to classify records. Under the statute, this responsibility is left solely to the President of the United States. So what the hell are we talking about with this <laughs> phony case? Well, it is true. I mean, it is true, isn't it? In other words, whatever documents the President decides to take with him, he has the absolute right to take them. He has the absolute right to keep them, or he can give them back to NARA if he wants. He talks to them like we were doing, and he can do that if he wants. That's the law, and it couldn't be more clear. Even the New York Times, just to finish up with this hoax, this is the next hoax. We had Russia, Russia, Russia. We had so many uh, impeachment hoax number one, impeachment hoax number two. <laughs> Who the hell else could take this stuff? I had a nice life. I had a nice, easy life. But I'm taking it for you because we're going to make our country great again. We're going to put America first, and we're doing it for you. But even the New York Times in a major article, big article, and they must hate — probably the writer was fired after he said this. <laughs> but it said headlines. It said that when it comes to asking for documents from former presidents, the only power that NARA has is to say, pretty please, quote, Asking nicely is about all they can do, and yet they reported me to the Department of Justice for criminal prosecution. They don't even have the right to ask. And if they do ask, they have to be very nice, and I don't have to give it. And yet I'm being prosecuted for this. And this is the New York Times saying it. Nothing like this has ever happened before, and hopefully will never happen again. And we are working all together because we're working as a country. And, you know, I'm probably the only person in history in this country that's been indicted, and my numbers went up. <laughs> really? 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 So true. You see the numbers. We're blowing them all away. It's crazy. Usually when that happens, you announce, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be leaving office immediately. And I want to spend more time with my wife and family and fight for my innocence. With me, it's just like crazy. What a life I have. I have a crazy life. But you know what? We became president of the United States, and we together did something that nobody's — when you look at all of the things we did, nobody — Probably nobody has ever done what we did, including rebuilding our military, biggest tax cuts in history, biggest regulatory cuts in history. All of the things that we did, we had no wars. We got out of wars. We beat ISIS. We defeated ISIS. 100 percent defeated ISIS. And got out of wars. And you would have never had Russia go into Ukraine. And you would have never had China you would have never had China talking like they're talking right now about Taiwan. And you'd never have any words coming out of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, like what he's saying about the United States and our president. No, we had a much different time. They respected our country, and they respected your president. They really did respect your president. Joe Biden is the most corrupt president in the history of our country, by far. 
Just two days ago, a very respected IRS whistleblower used to be very much a, you remember when the Democrats used to love whistleblowers? They don't like the whistleblowers now. <laughs> Revealed that Crooked Joe sat in a room while his son Hunter messaged a Chinese Communist Party official and said to this Chinese Party official, I quote, I am sitting here with my father, and we would like to understand why the commitment made has not been fulfilled. This is cash he's talking about. Yep. Tell the director, and it doesn't get reported in the newspapers, tell the director that I would like to resolve this now before it gets out of hand, and now means right now. It means tonight. You believe this? I didn't know he was that tough. <laughs> and if I get a call or a text from anyone involved in this other than you, Zhang or the chairman, I will make certain that between the man sitting next to me, my father, right next to me, Pop, hi, Pop, <laughs> and every person he knows, you will regret not following my direction. Now, can you imagine the newspapers not reporting this? Not a word of it in any of them, in any of them, mainstream. I'm sitting here waiting for the call, he said with my father. I'm sitting here with my father waiting for the call. In other words, send us money. Within 10 days, the Bidens got $5.1 million from China for absolutely no reason. They got $5.1 million. In fact, they've taken tens of millions of dollars from China. And that's probably why maybe he's not complaining about the fact that they're building military bases in Cuba. Maybe that's the reason, I guess. Mike, what do you think? It's not even believable. This stuff isn't even believable. The worst part of the whole story is that the press doesn't want to report it. Because, you know, there was a time like 15 years ago, 10 years ago, you would have gotten a Pulitzer Prize. Of course, they've been totally discredited because they gave Pulitzer Prizes for the accurate and wonderful reporting on Russia, Russia, Russia. Then it turned out to be a hoax. I said, you have to withdraw the prizes. They said, well, we don't know that and we don't want to do that. We've never done that before. I said, that's okay. Do it or I'm suing you. They said, we're not going to do it. And I sued them. You know, we're in court over that. We want them to return the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> and by the way, they're being decimated in court. It's very interesting. But we actually brought a lawsuit against them because they gave Pulitzer Prizes to the New York Times and the Washington Post for their accurate reporting on Russia, Russia, Russia. And even the papers now say it was a hoax. They all say it was a hoax, but they don't want to give back the prizes. So. They have to give back those prizes. They will. Joe Biden is a totally compromised president because they're bribing him. They're paying him off. They know all the money they've given, and it's far greater than anyone has been able to really understand. And I'll tell you what, Jim Jordan and Jamie Comer and their, their group has done an unbelievable job, but it's far greater than anybody knows. This is just some of the things. It's tens of millions of dollars, and that's just some of it that's been found. And again, the papers aren't reporting. And it's not only China, though. It's many other countries, including Ukraine. So we're giving hundreds of billions of dollars to Ukraine. I keep saying, why isn't Europe paying a like amount? So we're in for 160 billion, and Europe is in for 15 billion. And nobody thinks that's right or fair. And it affects them more than it affects us. These countries know every penny the Biden crime family has taken in. The countries know. Ukraine knows. China knows. They all know. There are many countries. So he can't even or ever go against them. He can't go against them because they'll reveal the corruption because they know exactly. They'll say, well, we sent the check here. We sent the check there. We said. So he has to be very nice to China, has to be very nice to Ukraine. And a huge success will be when the New York Times and The Washington Post and others put it on their front page, what's really happening here, because this is truly 100 times bigger than Watergate. This is a much bigger story than Watergate. That's why Biden doesn't mind that China has opened up these military installations and in the process of building a tremendous amount in Cuba. It's only 90 miles off our coast. He's basically said it's okay. He's not doing anything. He's not even saying anything. He's not talking about it. What that means for our great Cuban population in Miami, I love the Cuban pop population. We got, we got a record, I got a record number of votes. People were very, I got the Bay of Pigs Award. I was given the Bay of Pigs, it was a great honor. 
award by the Cuban population of Miami. But it means that this group of people in Miami that love Cuba, they want to get back there, they want to see their country, but it means for the rest of their lives, they will never see Cuba again. It's gone, because China is occupying Cuba right now. That means it's gone. And they were getting ready to make a big, if the election wasn't rigged, the Cuban thing would have been taken care of, and people could have gone back and forth to Cuba. Cubans, I'm talking about. They could have seen their family. They wouldn't have the problems that they have right now. He's given everything to Cuba and the dictator and dictators. And you know what that was. But we, it's, it's incredible that this can be allowed to happen. So unless I get back in, in which case, I will inform China that they have 48 hours to get any military and spy equipment out of Cuba. Or I will drop the hammer, and there will be tariffs unlike anything that China's ever seen before. And, you know, I took in hundreds of billions of dollars of taxes and tariffs from China. No other president has taken in 10 cents, not 10 cents. Took in hundreds of billions, gave $28 billion to the farmers because they were mistreated by China. <laughs> Who else does that? Who the hell else would do that? You tell me. They know. But he wants to do nothing because he can't. He's really bound to not do anything. Never forget, our enemies want to stop me because I'm the only one who can stop them. And I'm stopping them because of you. I didn't need this. I didn't need it. If these corrupt persecutions succeed, they will complete their takeover of this country and destroy your way of life forever. And that's where it's going. That's where it's going. It's a disgrace. They want to take away my freedom because I will never let them take away your freedom. It's very simple. They want to silence me because I will never let them silence you. And in the end, they're not after me. They're after you. And I just happen to be standing in their way. That's all it is. That's all it is. Very simple, actually. Ultimately, the radical left lunatics are coming after all of us because they know that our allegiance is not to them. Our allegiance is to our country and to our Creator. And that's why, under Biden, Christians are being persecuted like nothing this nation has ever seen before. I don't understand how people can vote. People of faith, and I'm not just talking about Christians, I'm talking about people of faith, can vote for these Democrats. They've become monsters. They're fighting you all the way on religion. You know, I watched Biden during debates when he could speak, and he was trying to say, you know, oh, I love being a Catholic. He, you know what they're doing to Catholics right now? There's never been an assault on Catholics the likes of which they're having right now, what they're having to go through. Biden's corrupt DOJ has targeted parents at school board meetings. They've sent SWAT teams to arrest pro-life activists. You know that. The FBI has been caught labeling devout Catholics as domestic terrorists and sending undercover spies into Catholic churches just as it was in the old Soviet Union days. Pretty rough stuff. Who can believe this? And how can you, as Christians, how can the people in this room vote for them? You know, they get 40%, 50%, 60% of a religious vote. How can they do that? And then they just go about trying to destroy religion. If you look at polls, you'll see religion people of faith, but religion is going down in terms of importance and popularity. This is not a question of importance and popularity. This is a fact. We love God, and we want to protect ourselves. We want to protect the, the cherished position of believing in God. And I think one of the biggest problems this country has right now is that as, as religion does go in the wrong direction, because it's something for you to adhere to and to believe in. It's so good. It keeps you sane. It keeps you honest. It keeps you good. It keeps you kind. It makes you help other people. And they're trying to take that away from you. And I just don't understand, where do they get 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of the vote?
It just doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. They lie. They lie about their positions. And you have to remember that. In 2024, you have to remember that. Protect your vote is the most important thing. But you have to remember that. And you do have to protect your vote. They want to destroy your religion, along with the fact that they obviously want to destroy your country when you have open borders, when you have no voter ID. Why do they not want voter ID? Because they want to cheat. Even the Democrats voted 82 percent in favor. Democrats, people that vote. Democrats voted 82 percent in favor of voter ID, but the politicians don't want it because they want to cheat. And with voter ID, it's very much harder to cheat. They're mean and they're very, very sick. They are mean and they are very sick. Over the next 16 months, our enemies will try harder than ever to divide us and to destroy us. The lies, abuse, and injustice that will come our way will be worse than ever before in the history of our country. To persevere, we must stand tall. We must stand strong. We have to be strong. We have to be stronger than ever before because they're coming at us. There's something wrong with these people. And I don't like saying that. You know, as president, you're the president of everyone. So I don't like saying that. But there is something wrong with these people. And we have to stand together or we're not going to have a country anymore. The more they throw at us, the more united we must become. The more vile the attacks, the more relentlessly they go after us. We must keep pushing forward no matter what. You just keep pushing forward. That's what I do. I get up. People say to me, sir, can I ask you a question? How the hell do you take it? I say, do I have a choice? I don't have a choice, right? Do I have a choice? I'd love not to have to, but they're uh, crazy people with there. They're lunatics. I've had the most successful business people in the country come up to me. A man who's one of the most successful. A vicious guy, very tough guy. I don't like him even. He thinks I'm his friend. I'm not because he's a bad person. <laughs> Unlike Governor Huckabee, who's a good person. He's actually tougher than this guy, but he's also a good person, the governor. But I tell you, he came up to me and he said, could I ask you one question? How do you get up in the morning? Every day they're coming at you with a different deal. I mean, it started with spying on your campaign. Then it went to the different impeachments and hoaxes and indictments. And how do you do it? And I actually said to him, it's like it almost becomes a weapon of war. You have to fight these people and you have to beat them. We beat them now for four years and now afterwards. And by the way, if I weren't running right now or if I was losing big in the polls instead of winning by the biggest numbers I've ever had, think of it, the biggest numbers I've ever had, not even close, they would stop in two minutes, I believe. Although maybe the hatred is so great. Actually, Lindsay and Mike, I think the hatred's so great they probably wouldn't stop. I think they would keep going, right? In my case. Normally they would stop, but in my case, I think they'd probably keep on going. <laughs> but if I didn't run, or if I would say, you know, I'm not going to run, or if my numbers were bad, where it looked like I wasn't going to make it, they wouldn't be focusing me. They would focus on whoever was leading. And they would go after that person, male or female, just as viciously as they go after me. And that person would not be able to handle it. That's why you have no choice but to vote for Donald Trump. Thank you. Isn't it great? Saturday night, we're here for religion. Is that nice? And what a job Ralph has done. But this isn't my campaign. This is our campaign. This has got to be our campaign. And with your help, we're going to we're going to see through this whole. We're going to see through it. We're going to take this job right to the finish. And we're going to have a country the likes of which we've never had before, better than ever. We're going to have it better than ever. No president has ever fought for Christians as hard as I have. 
And I will keep on fighting, and I'll fight hard until I'm back behind that desk in the Oval Office, the resolute desk. Resolute desk. Thank you. Ralph a question. Were your other candidates treated this way? I don't think so. Actually, I saw one who was booed off the stage. He was booed off. I don't think they were But, you know, the greatest honor is, in my case, you feel this way because we went through four great years. We did things that nobody thought could be done, and we're going to go into them in a minute. But we did things that nobody thought could be done. So when you do feel this way, I really feel good because that means you accepted and loved what we did in that four years. We did more than probably and probably any, and many people say this, more than any president, we re rebuilt our military. What we did is so, so incredible. We did it together. I did it because of you. I was helped by you, and we had your support, and it was amazing. So I'm very uh, gratified to get that kind of support, because in my case, it's not just words. You know, when I first came in, I said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to cut taxes, and I'm going to cut regulations, and I'm going to do all these things. And, you know, people would say, yeah, okay, it's just words, because it's a politician. All of a sudden, I become a politician. I never had that moniker before, but all of a sudden, I become a politician. But I did all the things, but I actually did much more than I ever promised I'd do. So it makes me feel very good. We totally transformed the federal judiciary, appointing nearly 300 judges a record to interpret the law and the Constitution as written. I withstood vicious attacks to confirm three great Supreme Court justices, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. And I just hope, because they're under tremendous assault and pressure. I mean, they are. Look, you know what, you see what's going on. In the sports world, they call it playing the ref. You know, they say horrible, horrible things, and some people change. A lot of them change, and we can't let that happen. I just hope that these justices, who are brilliant and very good people, I hope they remain strong in the face of the harassment and intimidation that is coming their way and has come their way by the radical left lunatics. I just hope they can withstand it. I hope they don't go to the other side so they feel a little bit better about going out to dinner. That happens so often. With politicians, it happens, but it happens with judges. And we hope that's not going to happen with them or any of our judges. Exactly one year ago today, those justices were the pivotal votes in the Supreme Court's landmark decision ending the constitutional atrocity known as Roe v. Wade. Conservatives had been trying for 50 years, exactly 50 years. Amazing that today is the day. I don't know. Did you set this up on purpose? Was that done purposely? <laughs> this is the day, one year. I mean, it's, today is the birthday of that decision. Did you do that? I mean, it wasn't just by a fluke, right? I assume you did. Whether you did or not, this is the uh, birthday, so it was pretty good. And Ralph's birthday, too. That was set up, too. That's something, <laughs> something strange is going on here. You know what they'll say? It's Trump's fault. Trump's fault. <laughs> but I got it done, and nobody thought it was even a possibility. They've been fighting. Good people, strong people, smart people have been fighting for 50 years, and it never even came close to getting done. I don't believe they've ever even taken a vote. I mean, never even came close. It was something that wasn't going to happen. I got it done. 
I get a kick out of these candidates and the, even the other side. Well, I don't know. I think I'm more pro-life. I'm this. And, and somebody stood up, a woman stood up and said, this guy ended Roe v. Wade. How the hell can you go against him? And I sort of said that myself, actually. <laughs> but I'm proud to be the most pro-life president in American history. Okay. From my first day in office, I took historic action to protect the unborn. Very historic. Nobody else get anything near what we did. And it put us in such a great position, that victory. That victory, we'll go into it, but that victory is a tremendous uh, victory in so many different ways because they are the radical people. When they're willing to kill a child, after birth, they're willing. You know, take it beyond the nine months. They are the radical people. They are the people that are really uh, in trouble with the Lord. Yes. I reinstated yes. and expanded the Mexico City policy. You know what that is. That was a big deal. Nobody else did it. Stop taxpayer funding for abortion providers. And at the United Nations, I made clear that global bureaucrats have no business attacking the sovereignty of nations that protect innocent life. And I did these things. and. I took heat, and I also got great love. I mean, you know, you have two sides to it, but I got great love. And I was the first sitting president ever to attend the March for Life rally right here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Under my leadership, we did more to uphold religious freedom than any administration in history by far. I could name some very good presidents that most of the people in this room would like, and they didn't attend the rally, and they didn't do the things we did, like the Mexico City policy. They didn't do anything, and yet most of the people in this room would like some of the people I would name. But we did it all. We fearlessly protected the conscience, rights of doctors, nurses, teachers, and faith groups like the Little Sisters of the Poor, who were treated so badly. We came to their rescue. We stopped the Johnson Amendment from interfering with pastors' free speech under retaliation of terminating tax exemption. They really went after people. I was in a room, and I said, why don't you speak up more? And had 50 pastors in the room, two rabbis, 50 pastors. We had a number of religious leaders, heavy on the pastors, I will say that. But they said to me, I said, I want to hear you. They said, we really can't speak because of the Johnson Amendment. This was in 2015, just before I announced. I said, that means that, explain it to me. If we speak out, and if the government wants to, they will take away our tax-exempt status. I said, so you have less power, and you're the people that I want to hear from. You have less power than we were in Trump Tower, 60 stories up, looking down. I said, than any people walking on that sidewalk outside. He said, yes, in many ways we do. We can't speak up. And I got it so that the people that we want to hear can now speak up. So that Mike Huck — well, Mike Huckabee spoke up anyway. I don't know. I did, <laughs> did this have any — I don't think it had much impact on you. It had no impact on Mike. But it had a lot of impact on a lot of other people, and they have been speaking up, and it's important that they do so. I issued guidance making clear that the right to freedom of worship does not end at the door of a public school. Public schools are in tremendous trouble. And I was the first and only president to convene a meeting at the United Nations to end religious persecution worldwide. No other president has ever brought it up. As president, I stood proudly with our friend and ally, the State of Israel. I did more for Israel, they say, than any other place. I kept my promise, recognized Israel's eternal capital, Jerusalem, and opened the American Embassy in Jerusalem. And I tell the story that sometimes, I don't know, it's maybe more of a good business story, but a general stood before me with something to sign, executive order, because I had won that battle. 
And it was a bill, essentially, for $2 billion to build an embassy in Jerusalem. And I said, General, what is this for? Sir, this is to build an embassy in Jerusalem. I said, this says $2 billion. How can you spend $2 billion on, like, I, I envisioned it as a one-story building, right? <laughs> Nobody in this room, if you're in the real estate business, would spend quite that much. Maybe you'd spend, like, $2. But I said, how can you, how can you ask for $2 billion? Well, that's what they told. By the time you buy the land, sir, and you build the building and everything else, it's going to cost $2 billion. So I called up our ambassador, and I said, uh, David, See if there's something we have there already. We own a lot of land in Jerusalem. Do we have a great piece? And maybe it has like a little building on it where we can fix it up real cheap and we can. <laughs> See, I'll always be in the real estate business, you know? Like, I'll always love that business, and I love that business. We did great at that That's a great business, but very creative. And I said, See what you have. They called me back two days later and said, Sir, we have a fantastic site. We've owned it for many, many years. You know, we were there sort of like early on, first. We have a great site, and there's a building on it that's been essentially abandoned, but it's a very strong structure. And we think we could fix it up and get it open very quickly. I said, how does it compare with the site that we're going to buy, that they want to buy for a ridiculous amount of money? By the way, that particular person who owned that site is not happy with me, I can tell you. That is not a person. We're going to pay hundreds of millions of dollars for this site. So I said, uh, what do you think of the building? I, well, I think we could fix it up. So they called me back a week later. I sent some people over. They said, sir, we can build a new embassy for $400,000. I said, let me ask you a question. It's the only time I ever said this. I said, listen, it sounds too cheap. We've got to make it work. <laughs> no, it actually, it actually sounded, I never did that. Usually I'll say, make it 200000 I said, we've got to make it more. It doesn't sound right. But a friend of mine, in a big building in Manhattan, has beautiful white stone, beige, beautiful beige and white stone opposite his elevator bank. And every time I go into that building, he says, now he says President, but he used to say, Donald, Donald, look at the stone, it's so beautiful. And after saying it to me like 12 times, I said, what is it? He said, it's Jerusalem stone. It's so beautiful, very, very expensive. He's a very rich guy, he talks about the cost of stone, right? That's why he's rich, I guess, right? When you think. <laughs> but he said, he said, it's so beautiful, and I'm so proud of it. Jerusalem stone. So now I'm sitting here talking about building something in Jerusalem, and we're going to do a renovation of an existing building. And I said, listen, can we wrap that building in Jerusalem stone? Is it expensive? He said, absolutely not. We're in Jerusalem. We can buy it for people. <laughs> so the whole building is made out of Jerusalem stone. Isn't that good? Sort of good. Business story. But I did something else. I also, and we got it built. You know, that thing would have never been built, the $2 billion building. It would have been years and years and years. And you might not have, they probably would have ended the whole concept of even moving the embassy to Jerusalem. It would have. So we got it built. And there's no reason to do any better because it's really a beautiful embassy, one of our nicest embassies, I think. But someday they'll come along and say, let's waste billions of dollars and do it the way we originally planned. But it's a great embassy, and I was very proud to do it. But we did something else that they weren't even asking for. The most pro-Israel people weren't even asking. I recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. And that has been going on. And that has been going on for 51 years. They've been trying to get that. People would fly in, fly out. They'd have meetings every two years. People would fly in, talk about it, fly out. I brought some people that truly knew Israel and understand Israel. I said, explain Golan Heights to me. You have five minutes or less. And they did it in about three minutes. But they talked about the importance. They talked about the height, the visibility, the military protection, all of the different things. And I proved it. And nobody even asked for it because they thought that was too far-fetched. But I got Golan Heights approved for Israel, and nobody talks about that one, but that was a big one. And then the biggest of all, but this administration has totally blown it. Uh, I pulled out of the horrible, horrible, one-sided, miserable Iran nuclear deal, which was expiring just about now anyway. And they were ready, had the election gone the way it should have gone, they were ready to make any deal with me. And uh, as you know, I said to China, you can't buy. If you buy, we're not going to do business with you. Okay, we won't buy. No oil from Iran. Nobody was buying oil. They were ready to make a deal. We would have made a great deal for everybody. They would have been 
terrific. We all would have, they were dying to make a deal. And then when that tragedy turned out, the world's most corrupt election, when that tragedy turned out, what happened is everybody started buying oil from Iran, and Iran now is very rich. And instead of having a great negotiating position, we have a terrible negotiating position. And they're actually trying to make a deal that was worse than the first one. The first one was horrible. The first one was a short-term deal. I mean, it wasn't like it was for 50 years or 100 years. It would be expiring just about now. So, and that was a license for them to make nuclear weapons. And you cannot let Iran have a nuclear weapon. You cannot let it happen because uh, bad things will happen if that happens. But uh, I got that approved. That was the biggest of all. That was bigger than Jerusalem. That was bigger than the Golan Heights. I always considered that to be the biggest. But unfortunately, they took that, they took that deal and didn't do anything. Iran was making, they were dying to make a deal. And they didn't do anything with it. And then, of course, we did the Abraham Accords, which would have been, I mean, something incredible. <laughs> something incredible. So we took care of Israel like no, no president has ever. In fact, they said if I ran for prime minister of Israel, I'd get 99% of the votes. I'm thinking about doing that. We delivered the largest tax cuts and regulatory cuts or in record in the history of our country. And we built the greatest economy in the history of the world. There's never been an economy like the economy we had. More jobs, more everything that we've ever had before. We achieved energy independence, and we're ready to be energy dominant. We were going to supply oil to all over Europe, everywhere. I was the one that brought up Nord Stream 2. You remember that. I brought, nobody ever heard of Nord Stream 2. I said to Germany, Angela Merkel, I said, you can't make that deal. If you make that deal, that means you're going to be subservient to Russia. She said, no, 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 Donald, this will be wonderful. It didn't turn out to be too good for them. <laughs> then gas prices, when I was in office, reached low numbers like $1.87 a gallon and even less. Think of that. Now they, they go to five, six, seven, eight, nine. It, oh, and it hasn't stopped. Wait till you see what's going to be happening over the next two years. We created the most secure border in U.S. history, built nearly 500 miles of border wall, which was so helpful got Mexico to give us 28,000 soldiers free of charge. I said, look, if you're not going to give them free, I'm going to have to tariff all of the cars that you're building. Because, you know, they took those car, car companies out of Detroit and other places, and they now build 32 percent of our cars that are built in Mexico. I said, I'm going to put tariffs on if you don't give us the soldiers. And they said, we would love to give you the soldiers. It would be <laughs> We had the Remain in Mexico. That's for all the people that are pouring in. And I believe the number is going to be, Lindsay, 15 million people by the end of this year. And they come out of mental institutions. They come out of jails. They come out of insane asylum, which is a stronger word. They said, don't use those words, sir. They're nasty. But insane asylums, very sick people. And they're being — and terrorists are being poured into our country like never before. And uh, I also terminated the ridiculous catch and release the ridiculous. You catch the people and you release them in our country, okay? Now, well, now with Biden, it basically that's what they do. But we caught the people and we released them outside of our country. I fully rebuilt the U.S. military, created Space Force, and defeated ISIS and brought our troops back home. You remember during the campaign, during the campaign, do you remember when they said, oh, he's going to bring us into World War III? He's going to bring us in personality type. I said, no, my personality is going to keep you out of World War III. That's what happened. But all of that was only the beginning, and here's just some of the bold agenda that I'll immediately implement when we become the 47th President of the United States. And I'll work with the people here and a lot of other people in Washington right now because I just rode through Washington and it doesn't look like it used to look with me. They have fences around their parks. They have tents up all over the place, tents. It's, this is the capital. This is the most important thing. Think of this, the capital of our country. It's got papers all over the streets. The sidewalks are filthy, dirty. I used to drive by and I'd be screaming over the phone, get those sidewalks clean, get this, get that. You got to get the tents down. You can't have the tents. You know, once those tents form, once you leave four or five of them, there was a group of four or five, and I told Secret Service, you got to get over it. We got to take it down immediately, because once that happens, you have 10, then you have 20, then you have hundreds. 
And what's happened to this city since I've been gone is, oh, it's so sad, it's so dirty and filthy, and people are stopping coming. And that's true in a lot of other cities, too. You look at Chicago, you look at San Francisco, look at New York, what's going on. All Democrat-run, but what's uh, — it was so sad to see. You know, I look forward to coming here, but it was a very sad trip between the airplane and here, because I'm looking at something that I don't even recognize, that it's so dirty and uh, — shouldn't be that way. It's a great, a great place, and it shouldn't be that way. When I get back into the Oval Office, I will totally obliterate the deep state. a deep state. People would say, yeah, I don't know. Now about everybody thinks, yeah, there's a deep state. It's a bad — I call it a bad state. I'll fire the unelected bureaucrats who have weaponized our justice system. And they have weaponized. And we'll create the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to declassify and publish all documents on deep state spying. They spy on so much. Censorship, corruption, including all of that on Christians. The Christians have been under siege under this administration. Just please remember that. Please remember that when they tell you about what, how much they love you. They don't love you at all. They don't love you at all. Never again will federal law enforcement be used to target religious believers. And hopefully never again will it be used to target opponents in an election, because that's what they're doing. Americans of faith are not a threat to our country. Americans of faith are the soul of our country. And when I'm back in the White House, I will once again appoint rock-solid conservative judges and mold the mold of justices like Antonin Scalia and the great Clarence Thomas, who is — who really they are going after right now very unfairly. You read that story very unfairly. And before Election Day 2024, I will again release the full list of names from which I will select my appointments to the United States Supreme Court. I did that last time, and it had a big impact. To stop the Marxist pro — and they are indeed Marxist, or worse, fascist Marxist — prosecutors who release rapists and murderers while persecuting conservatives and people of religion, I will direct a completely overhauled DOJ to investigate every radical DA in America, AG in America, for their illegal, racist, and reverse enforcement of the law. These are bad people. And they're being run by the DOJ, just in case you have any questions. You know, in New York, where they go after me, they've had a problem. All of a sudden, I got, this, I got a DA who's after me. Bragg. But you know what they did? They put people from the DOJ into the DA's office. Can you believe it? I don't even think that's legal, they say. But I have, D I have DOJ prosecutors in there telling them how to go about it. But they haven't done a very good job because they have no case. To deter illegal immigration coming from jails and these mental institutions that I've told you about, all of the terrorists, we're infiltrating, and they're infiltrating our country like never before in the history of our country. I don't think any country in the world has gone through this. And I always say, even a third-world country wouldn't allow people in like this. They would stand there with sticks and stones. They wouldn't allow it to happen. One thing, nobody's been able to tell me why this is a good thing. Why is it a good thing? It's not good politically. Now, they all say, oh, no, they'll go and they'll vote. Well, first of all, we're doing very well with Hispanics, and large numbers are Hispanics. But, but, you know, even more so, they don't need people because they cheat so much on the voting, they don't need. But if you think about their policies, open borders, high taxes, high interest rates, no voter ID, uh, bad military, woke military, all these things, you can't win on policy unless you cheat. Just think about it. How can you win on any of those things? Does anybody really — I don't care, give me a, the most liberal person — does anybody who's liberal or anything else want people to march and steam into our country and just come into our country? We have no checks, no balances. We have no idea who they are. And they do. They come from prisons and mental institutions, many of them. 
The mental institutions and the prisons and countries all over the world are being emptied out into the United States of America right now. Now, how the hell is that good politics? I don't understand it. And yet, they get votes. They get votes. Somebody someday will explain it, or maybe people just don't know. That's why I say it as many times as I can, because nobody can want that to happen. I've already announced that I will sign on day one an executive order ending automatic citizenship for the children of illegal aliens. You have to do that. We're the only country in the world that does it. If you literally set a foot in the sand across the border, your child is called welcome to being an American citizen. It's so unfair to our country. In addition, here are some of the other actions I'll take to restore the border of the United States and to make it safe again. We had the most successful and strongest border in American history. And to get it back, I will immediately reinstate all of the incredibly successful border policies of the Trump administration, including our safe third agreements, which you know what that means. Remain in Mexico, that's pretty obvious what that means. Our asylum bans, we didn't let a lot of bad people in. Uh, we will complete even more border wall. We built the border wall, and then we were going to add another 200 miles. And that's what I knew they actually wanted, because uh, in three weeks, they could have had it completed. And they not only didn't complete it, they took the gates, the fences, and the walls, and they moved it to other parts of the country so that nobody could get to it. And I said, you know, they must really want to have open borders, because we added, in certain areas, it's a little like water coming through, right? Then you have certain areas that you learn when the wall is up. So we were closing up those areas would have been just incredible. And they didn't want that to happen. They actually took it. Texas wanted to buy it from the federal government. They said, we don't sell it. We wouldn't sell it to you under any circumstances. So that's when I realized for the first time that they were actually serious, that they want totally open borders, which is absolutely insane. And uh, we're going to restore the prosecution policy, which saw a record number of prosecutions of illegal aliens who had to leave the country. We had to get them out. Sometimes they were so evil, so bad, that would put them in prisons in our own country because they have a tendency to come back. But they weren't able to come back because we had a very strong border. Uh, drugs now are, are, think of this number. We did very well in drugs. Not well enough, by the way. No, nobody does well enough until they're gone because I believe we're going to lose 350,000 people this year and destroy families all over our country. It's like an invasion. But drugs now are 12 times higher than they were just two and a half, three years ago, 12 times higher. They're pouring in. Fentanyl is pouring in. President Xi and I had a deal. He was going to make it criminal to make fentanyl in China. There'd be no more fentanyl coming from China. When I didn't win the election, meaning I won it, but when it was rigged, when the election took place, he said, well, I don't have to go by that deal anymore. He didn't want that deal. But it's made much of it in China, and it flows through the border. We want people to come into our country but we want them to come into our country legally. We want people to come in. We want them to come in le legally. And furthermore, I'll fully implement Title 42 across the entire southern border based on all of the diseases that illegal aliens are bringing in. It's unbelievable that they, even the judge in the case said, do you know what you're doing? Because the Biden administration wanted it terminated. And the judge wouldn't do it, but it terminated itself. Judge can't do anything about that. Judge said, you know what you're doing by asking for this? And we will have to do rapid deportation of all of these border crosses. But we have people that are very seriously ill with contagious diseases, and they're pouring into our country along with all of the rest. We have no idea who these people are. Nobody cares. Nobody cares on the other side. They can just come in. A friend of mine called. He said, how do I go about becoming a citizen? Do I take classes? I say, well, don't say I said it, but if you happen to walk down to the border, just walk across and you'll be fine. <laughs> you know, it takes some people 10, 12 years. They go take tests. It's a beautiful thing to watch. And they love the country so much, and yet others just walk across the border. I'll also use Title 42 to end the child trafficking crisis by returning all trafficked children to their families in their home countries immediately. Horrible. Horrible. And I'll shift massive portions of the existing federal law enforcement apparatus 
to immigration enforcements, including parts of the DEA, ATF, FBI, and Homeland Security investigators. We're going to move them around. I will issue a policy directive making clear that a core national defense mission is to protect American sovereignty, and therefore, we must use any and all resources necessary to stop this incredible, incredible invasion. It's an invasion, including moving thousands of troops currently stationed overseas and elsewhere to our own southern border. <laughs> Following the Eisenhower model, I don't know if you know this, but Eisenhower was very strong on the border. We will carry out the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. And we're going to get the bad ones out quickly. We've got a lot of real bad ones. You know, these countries are very smart. I got to know all of the heads of the countries. They're very smart, very streetwise. And they don't let their good people come. They send the people in the caravans that they don't want. Even if they're not officially criminals, if they're not officially, you know, bad people, as we say, or people with serious medical problems, they want their people to stay in their countries. They don't want them to leave. And they send and they organize many of the caravans. The people, the heads of the countries organize these caravans. And they come right into the United States now. We stopped them. We stopped them cold, but they come right into the United States now. I will invoke the Alien Enemies Act, something people didn't even know we had, to remove all known or suspected gang members, drug dealers, or cartel members from the United States, ending the scourge of illegal alien gang violence once and for all. We were very tough on MS-13, the gang members. We were very — they don't like me at all. They don't like me too much. We will destroy the cartels, including by deploying U.S. Navy to impose a full naval embargo to close the waters of our region, because the land will be closed up, and to all smugglers and traffickers. And, you know, they traffic mostly in women, just in case you didn't know that. It's mostly women, not children, not men. It's mostly in women. It's a horrible thing. It sounds like almost a prehistoric thing, but it's not. It's very modern. And what's made it so bad is the Internet. It's like a big, big, huge business, but they traffic mostly in women. During my administration, we also took extraordinary steps to improve vetting for legal entry to keep criminals, thugs, and terrorists the hell out of our country. We strengthened the citizenship test by a lot. We stripped citizenship from those who threatened our security as a nation. We did social media vetting and created the first ever national vetting center. It's very successful. We found laws that had never been used before, and we use them now, because it's not easy to go through Congress, but there are so many laws. We used many of them, and very successful, including the right to tariff by the President, because, again, China paid us and other countries paid us hundreds of billions of dollars, and it saved our businesses, too, made them competitive. Today, I'm announcing a new plan to protect the integrity of our immigration system. Federal law prohibits the entry of communists and totalitarians into the United States. But my question is, what do we do with the ones that are already here that grew up in it? I think we have to pass a new law for them. Using federal law in Section 212F, of the Immigration and Nationality Act, I will order my government to deny entry to all communists and all Marxists. Those who come to and join our country must love our country. We want them to love our country. We don't want them when they want to destroy our country. Welcome to America. We want to destroy your country. Thank you very much. So we're going to keep foreign, Christian-hating, communists, Marxists, and socialists out of America. We're keeping them out of America. When I was president, the world was stable and calm because America was respected and strong. Now, as we see in Russia and all of these other places, this whole world is on fire. This world is on fire. Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, I will have the horrible war between Russia and Ukraine totally settled. I'll have it done in 24 hours. I say that, and I would do that. That's easy compared to some of the things. But I'd get that done in 24 hours. I know them both. I know them both. As the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. See that?
I will be your — and I will be your peacemaker. I was your peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But it's so true, the peacemakers. I will stop Joe Biden's inflation nightmare, save the U.S. economy, and I will always protect Medicare and Social Security, which for some very bad politicians, it's under siege. I don't know if you know that. It's under siege by people that tried to do it before. I won't mention names. As your president, I will continue to stand proudly for pro-life policies, just as I did for four strong years. And we cannot, in this room, and Republicans, but the people in this room, we cannot be afraid to take on the Democrat extremists. We can't be afraid. We have to be strong and powerful. That's why, when I'm reelected, I will continue to fight against the demented late-term abortionists in the Democrat Party who believe in unlimited abortion on demand and even executing babies after birth. These are very troubled people in the American public is on our side by overwhelming margins. You know, the politicians are going to have to learn to talk about this issue because they are the radicals. We're not the radicals. When you kill a baby after four months, six months, eight months, nine months, remember the governor of Virginia? He said, yes, the baby is born. You lay the baby aside, and then you make a determination as to what you do with the babies. In other words, he would kill the baby after — and. You have many. They believe in that. They, that's what they want. They are the radical extremists. We're not the radical extremists. And politicians have to say that. They have to say that because they come out as radical. And the Democrats that believe in this late-term abortion, thanks to the Supreme Court decision of exactly one year ago, we gave those who have long been fighting for pro-life cause negotiating power for the first time ever. You have tremendous negotiating power. Now, with Roe v. Wade, you had none. You had no power. We've now given pro-life people tremendous power to negotiate something that will be happy, that will be good for everybody. And you have power for the first time. You didn't have that power. You had no power. They could do anything. They could kill the baby after the baby was born. They could kill the baby in the ninth month. These are horrible, horrible things to think about. And even other countries, other than two countries, I won't mention their names, China <laughs> and North Korea. They have very strong limits. But I believe the greatest progress for pro-life is now being made in the states where everyone wanted to be. That's one of, one of the reasons they wanted Roe v. Wade terminated, is to bring it back into the states where a lot of people feel strongly it should be and where legal scholars feel very strongly it should be, with the three exceptions that I support and Ronald Reagan before me supported for rape, incest, and for the life of the mother. A lot of people are, are more and more coming into that fold, and uh, it's something you have to very consider. You have to go with your heart. You have to go with your mind. You have to make that decision, but the three exceptions. And Ronald Reagan was uh, there a long time ago, and I got through two very successful campaigns. Actually, my second campaign was much more successful. I got 12 million more votes, so I don't know. I wonder what happened. I wonder what happened. However, there, of course, remains a vital role for the federal government in protecting unborn life. And it's very important. And I propose for you tonight, just uh, as I did when I said that, we will win the Supreme Court decision on abortion. Remember I said that during my campaign? Everyone said, that's not going to happen. Nobody thought that was going to happen. But I will fight for you like no president has ever fought before. We'll get something done for the country. We're going to be for the country. 
We will defeat the radical Democrat policy of extreme late-term abortion, and we will bring everybody together to protect our precious unborn babies in a very, very big way. And now you have the power to do it because we terminated Roe v. Wade. Every child born and unborn is a sacred gift from God. Thank you. But you're in a much different position than you were before. Before, you had, you had nothing to negotiate with. Today, you're, uh, you're in the driver's seat, very much in the driver's seat. Under my leadership, the United States will also rejoin the Geneva Consensus Declaration created by my administration and signed by 36 nations to reject the globalist claim of an international right to abortion. This declaration affirms the family as the foundation of a good and great society and states that every human being has the inherent right to life. And Joe Biden withdrew the United States from this historic declaration his very first week in office, as he did so much else. They ended Anwar, the biggest drilling site in the world, probably larger than probably larger than Saudi Arabia, if you can believe it. This was in Alaska. Ronald Reagan couldn't get it done. Nobody could get it done. I got it done. And in the first week in office, he terminated Anwar. Would have been unbelievable. Would have been great. But we'll bring it back. We'll bring it back. So many different things they terminated. But some things they couldn't terminate, like the tax cuts. They have never been able to do that. A lot of the regulation cuts that created all those jobs, they're having a hard time with that. But I'll return us to where we were right on day one. We're going to be returning our country very quickly. It's going to happen very fast. We know the right people. You know, I went through a lot of people. Some were fantastic. They were great. And some weren't good. But I came here, and I was only in Washington 17 times during my entire life. I read this in an article, so I assume it's true. Of course, it was written, <laughs> it's written by a group that I'm not a big believer. But they said 17 times. I never stayed over. And I wasn't a part of Washington society, so I had to rely on people for recommendations. And many of them were good. Look, we rebuilt our military. We did so many incredible things, the tax cuts, the regulation cuts. We had great people, but we had some people that uh, I wouldn't have chosen if given a second shot. We had weak people. We had stupid people. We had people <laughs> that had no leadership ability. We had some very bad people. We had some very great people that I'd use again in a heartbeat. Look, look at all the things we did. We did that because of great people. But now I know everybody. I know people. I don't have to rely on some rhino saying, why don't you give us this one to head intelligence? How about this guy to head intelligence, sir? You know, you had to rely on some rhinos that you don't want to rely on anymore. But you really learn, and you have to learn fast if you got some problems. But as we continue to fight for the unborn, and conservatives also have a duty to support the loving choice of adoption, including faith-based adoption. That's why, as part of extending the Trump tax cuts, you know, we're going to have to — the time is coming up. We're going to have to extend that. I will ask Congress to expand the adoption tax credit. We'll do that because a lot of people have been adopting, and that's a great thing. Another top priority will be to expel the communists and these terrible people that have taken over our education system, when you look. I will immediately sign a new executive order to cut federal funding for any school pushing critical race theory, transgender insanity, and other inappropriate racial, sexual, or political content on our children. say this. Can you believe this? Can you imagine saying this 10 or 15 years ago? I will fight for parents' rights. Of course you fight for <laughs> Today, I have to say, I have to make it, I will fight for parents' rights. Of course you fight for parents' rights. Who would ever think you have to say that as a politician or as a person at a microphone, including the right to send your child to the public, private, charter, or religious school of your choice? <laughs> at the same time, I refuse to abandon our public school system to these lunatics. 
because what's happening there is terrible. That's why I will fight for the direct election of school principals by the parents, the parents of the school. If any principal is not getting the job done, the parents should be able to vote to fire them immediately and to select someone who will. And I will not give one penny to any school that has a vaccine mandate or mask mandate from kindergarten to college. And something else I find hard to believe that I have to even say, it's so ridiculous. It's so horrible and so ridiculous. I will keep men out of women's school. So, so horrible. And I will sign a law prohibiting child sexual mutilation in all 50 states. Prohibited. And on day one, I will reinstate the Trump ban on transgenders in the military. We had it then. Because our warriors should be focused on crushing American enemies, on being strong, on having the image of being strong. They have to be powerful. They have to be strong, especially when you see what's happening in the world today. Not catering to radical gender ideology. So you know I had this in the military. And a lot of the generals that I dealt with, the real generals, the good ones, the, the generals that weren't involved in the worst, most embarrassing day of our lives as a country, and that was the removal of our military from Afghanistan before our American citizens were taken out, before our soldiers were protected, leaving $85 billion worth of brand new Trump equipment. I bought it all brand new, beautiful. New tanks, new planes. 70, think of this, 70,000 vehicles, some of them, many of them armor plated, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars and even million dollars each. 700,000 rifles, guns, and that type of equipment. And now Afghanistan is the second or third largest seller of military equipment in the world because they don't need 700,000 rifles, do they? The best equipment, the finest equipment, the night goggles that they have are better than ours, brand new, not even taken out of the box. Now they fight at night because they never did. They, could, they couldn't see. Now they see very nicely. <laughs> but as you know, in the military, you're not allowed to take virtually any drugs. You're not allowed to take drugs. You take an aspirin, you have a problem. And to have this operation, you have massive amounts of drugs required on a daily basis. Massive, massive amounts of drugs. Furthermore, I will ban all taxpayer funding for sex or gender transitions at any age. And just as I've done for four years, I will fully uphold our Second Amendment. We need our Second Amendment. I will bring back free speech in America. And finally, to restore pride in our history and confidence in our future, I will lead a massive year-long salute to America to celebrate the 250th anniversary on July 4th. This was July 4th, 1776, okay? There are other dates you hear about, but this is the date that we recognize, 1776. And we're going to have a big celebration, and it's going to be a celebration like we really deserve in this country for everything we've gone through. With you at my side, we will give our nation's founding the amazing anniversary party that America needs and so richly deserves. Days from now, all of us will be celebrating this year's Independence Day at a very challenging time for our country. 
As we do, let us remember the words of one Massachusetts preacher during the Revolutionary War on an autumn night in 1777, when the fate of our nation looked very, very bleak, much as it does in many ways right now. Be of good courage, he urged the patriots in the pews, because the cause of American independence is a glorious, glorious cause. Today, we are a nation in decline, and it is because of our corrupt and inept leadership and the power of modern-day weaponry. It's so powerful, so horrible. It's so horrible. The levels of power, you've never seen anything like it. Shouldn't even be discussed. It wasn't talked about very much during my term. I didn't want to have anyone talking about it. But the level of power of modern-day weaponry is, is horrible. It's the most dangerous period in the history of our country. It's time for us, because of all of this, so scary, we have leaders that don't have a clue. We have leaders that have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea. We have leaders that are totally corrupt. These are corrupt people. It's time for us to keep our faith, our unity, and our resolve. We must be strong like never before. We must be unstoppable. Together, we will take on the communists and the Marxists and the fascists and the globalists and the fake news media, which is just as bad as all of that. And we have to take on crooked Joe Biden and the worst administration in the history of this country. And propelled by the spirit of July 4th, 1776, we will win a righteous and resounding victory on November 5th, 2024. And we will make America great again greater than ever before. Thank you all very much. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. in my opinion, one of the best speeches we have ever heard from the 45th President of the United States right here tonight at the Faith in Freedom Conference. I have probably seen this President speak over well over a hundred times, and I gotta tell you, he delivered nothing but straight red meat facts to the base here tonight, all based around faith, freedom, and taking back this country from the radical left. Went over immigration, went over vaccine, went over education, went over things that are going on in our pop culture, went over the Ukraine war, went over absolutely every aspect of his 2024 campaign right here tonight. Wow. We sat right there and watched it, and I just absolutely could not retweet enough sound bites coming from uh, his speech tonight. Unbelievable. Uh, just really uh, impressed by that. Hey, we want to thank our friends over so many different partners tonight. We want to thank our friends over at the Birch Gold Group. Don't remember, you know, don't forget, go, go text the words Trump right now to 989898 to the Birch Gold Group. Protect your investment, protect your RRA, transition from a gold, from a traditional IRA over to a gold backed IRA. Our friends over the Birch Gold Group also want to thank our friends over at Blackout Coffee. Don't forget, Patriotic Coffee, great coffee. You got to have it every morning. I know I do. 
light, medium, dark roast. Go text right now. Go to Blackout Coffee. Put that RSPN code in there to save big on that. Don't forget about my Patriot Supply as well. Be prepared for emergency, any kind of different food shortages, things like that. Prepare for that. Go to prep2023.com. That's prep2023.com. Get your supply of food right there. Don't forget, put that promo code RSPN to save as well. And lastly, the Trumpinator. After tonight's speech, I would think that you would want something like the Trumpinator in your collection at your home and in your office. So go check it out. It will likely sell out. So what a collectible that is. And remember tonight's uh, speech here at Faith and Freedom by going online and and, and absolutely uh, pick up that Trumpinator. But like I said, this was a fantastic speech tonight. If you missed part of it, you can scroll back on Rumble and watch it from the very beginning here. He spoke at it. He started about 8.03 here local time, so it's just now kind of wrapping up now. So what a fantastic speech. Go back and do it. Go ahead and share this broadcast as well. Uh, we're going to go into prayer. We're going to end tonight's uh, broadcast in prayer as we should uh, right here. And we appreciate you following us. You can follow us on social media platforms. You can follow me as well at Brian Glenn TV across Twitter, on Instagram and Facebook. And, of course, on Truth Social, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter uh, at rsbnetwork.com. That rsbnetwork.com, sign up for our newsletter. You can also donate there on our website. Don't forget to download our app. If you don't have our app, simply go into your Google, your in your uh, Android, your iPhone, download the app. It's absolutely free at RSPN and take us on the road. I'm going to step aside as we conclude tonight's broadcast. We appreciate you guys. The last couple days have been wonderful. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you for your attention. And thank you for your prayers. Uh, as we wrap up things at the Faith and Freedom Coalition, the road to majority here in Washington, D.C. Until next time, so long, everybody. Good night and God bless. We need to kind of pause occasionally, I think, uh, to recognize that, uh, you know, certainly um, there, there are political elements to this, but whenever this was just beginning, uh, it, was, it was just a vision, right? It was just a, uh, an aspiration and, um, and a, a, an investment, a truly kind of doubling down for the future. Uh, and um, we don't often, we, I, I don't think that we do this quite enough. Thankfully, we, we, we sang a nice song to Ralph, but, uh, but Ralph, why don't you stand up here for me real quick? Uh, so John and Mac are also going to bring up, uh, <clears throat> on behalf of uh, the Faith and Freedom Coalition, I'm going to, we're going to present this to you today as uh, the first presentation of uh, the Faith and Freedom Coalitions. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is a replica of a flag flown by George Washington's armada, his private uh, navy in the 1700s, and... Um, as the name suggests, I'm actually just going to read a, a brief little excerpt. We had this commission for you, Ralph. Uh, as many of you know, he is a bit of a, of a historian, especially uh, during, founding, uh, during our founding days. And, uh, and so he's schooled in a lot of the, the kind of subtleties of uh, what brought about the nation's, uh, this nation's uh, origins. This is what's known, uh, some as the pine tree flag, others the, an appeal to heaven flag. I'll read this briefly. In the early days of the war for independence, America faced innumerable difficulties. The choice of a national flag uh, remained unanswered for months due to a more pressing issues, like arranging a defense and forming a new government. However, a flag was still urgently needed by the military to differentiate the newly forged American forces from the oncoming British. Temporary flags were quickly employed. One of the most widespread designs, uh, both on land and sea, became this flag, the pine tree flag, also known as the appeal to heaven flag. When George Washington commissioned the first ever officially sanctioned military flag for the United States in 1775, Colonel Joseph, uh, Joseph Reed uh, commissioned co uh, the captains asking, please fix upon a particular flag color for a flag, a signal by which our vessels may be known one to another. Uh, what, to think, what do you think of a flag with a white ground, a tree in the middle, and the motto, Appeal to Heaven, the flag of our floating ba batteries? In, the, in New England, the, the Liberty flag became a prominent symbol for the independence movement. Um, based on John Locke's two treaties on government, the people have no other remedy in this 
as in all other cases where they have no judge on earth but to appeal to heaven. So we believe ultimately that uh, certainly it's, it's, a, it's a flag and a standard for our American uh, founding, but ultimately for us as citizens, uh, while we do have an appeal to our, uh, our earthly governings, ultimately our appeal remains to heaven and to our heavenly father. And so as we adjourn for this, our 14th conference, Ralph, on behalf of a grateful team at uh, the Faith and Freedom Coalition, would you accept this as uh, a token of our appreciation, our respect, and our um, allegiance to you as a, a truly visionary uh, leader? We thank, thank you, my friend. He lied to me. He told me he was going to thank our sponsors, but that's okay. Thank you all very much. I'm very grateful, and I'm very honored to be on the same team with you. Uh, before we pray, there's one other person I have to thank, and that is uh, my best friend, my longtime collaborator, the First Lady of Faith and Freedom Coalition, my wife, Joanne. Joe, thanks for everything. Thank you, honey. And you know, President Trump, oh, oh, one other thing before we pray. Save the day. Road to Majority 2024 will be right here, June 20th through 22nd. If you go on our website this coming week and register, there will be a registration page. You will get a 10% discount on your registration if you do it by this coming Friday. So register this week, and we will see you, you here one year from today. Okay? Right here. You know, President Trump mentioned how well we're doing among Hispanic voters and how well we're mobilizing. I think we have some Hispanics here tonight, don't we? <laughs> and... We have one of the best Hispanic community organizers in America on our team, and the director of our Hispanic initiative, Nilsa Alvarez, is going to close us in prayer. Nilsa, come on up. Mi familia. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. Thank you because you are the first to have never given up on America. Thank you because you don't throw in the towel on any one of us in this room. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for bearing with us every step of the way. We admire and honor your patience and your loving kindness that draws us to your presence. Father, in this moment, we appeal to the courts of heaven, and we ask that you, as the Holy Father you are, but as the righteous judge of nations that you truly are, let the gavel of righteousness and justice from the courts of heaven be heard in the courts of America. Return justice to the streets of our cities. Return innocence to the lives of our children. Restore education to the classrooms of every state. Father, we pray that our nation would turn back to you. And Father, we declare in this moment and we decree that every person in this room will leave anointed and empowered to fulfill their prophetic destiny in leading their communities and this very nation back to your heart as sons and daughters of the kingdom. So we lift you up, we worship you, and as you have promised, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And with this, we strive 
forward and we will walk in the promise that in you we can do all things, including rebuilding America in the powerful name of Jesus and by the powerful anointing of your Holy Spirit, we declare this so. Amen and amen. What's up, guys? My name is Jaded Hurd, and you're watching Right Side Broadcasting Network. I have a new show over there on Rumble that comes out every Tuesday and Friday called Let It Be Heard. What we do is react to videos, we analyze the culture, and we analyze politics from a biblical perspective. I think you're going to enjoy it, so I'll see you over there. God bless. Blackout Coffee. Fresh roasted, bold flavors, serving heroes on the front lines. Blackout! Blackout coffee, baby! Blackout coffee! From the ingredients we use to the values as a company we have, quality is something Blackout Coffee drinkers expect. But where did it start? Meet John. Our thought process in the beginning was to make a coffee for all the everyday American uh, that works hard, plays hard, and never stops. We actually started playing around with the beans and we came up with different types of beans to make a really strong coffee that does not give you the jitters. My name is Doc and I am the uh, lead roaster for Black Hot Coffee. To me, I, I've i tried all sorts of different uh, coffee, even the smaller uh, independent brands, and Black Hot's just different, it tastes different. And I actually came across them while working for a different company and I could smell the roast going on and I'm like, hmm, I need to try that one. It's not coffee. Not to me, it's freedom. Right Side Broadcasting is known for panning the crowds, showing the packed arenas and allowing you to see the truth. They've covered hundreds of rallies, briefings, marches, CPAC, and the historic overturning of Roe vs. Wade. Right Side Broadcasting was created in 2015 by our founder, Joe Seals creating a unique broadcasting experience that allows you to make your own decision 